Hello and welcome back to the KCC channel. I'm Rob and I hope you are having a wonderful day today. Today, we're jumping into a compilation of our last pro and nuclear revenge videos. We aim these videos at people who are working or driving or things like that so that they don't have to change videos as often. I hope you enjoy. Let's jump right in. All right, our first story today comes to us from Reddit admin dumb 87. <laughs> it's so true. How I got a car dealership to give my friend a newer car. Let's jump right in. Circa 2020 January, my friend makes a stupid decision and buys a brand new car he can't afford. His insurance is like $400 a month. He makes like $10.25 an hour working as a shift supervisor at McDonald's. His car payment is like $7.95 a month. Now, at $10.25 an hour, 30 hours a week, that's a weekly income of about $300 a week or about $1,230 a month. So, yeah. So my friend came to me for help because I used to sell cars and know the industry pretty well. I go over his paperwork. The dealer did rip him off, but my friend is trying to find a way to get out of this mess. And ripping someone off isn't illegal. They did, of course, overcharge him for warranty. They gave him a higher APR. They had add-ons, etc. But none of that is illegal. And I know the only way I can get my friend out of this deal is if they did something illegal. So I look at his finance application that my friend signed. It correctly listed his income, which turned a light bulb on in my head. No bank is going to approve someone for a $795 car payment if they're only making $1,200 a month. It does not make mathematical sense to do that. So I started searching through his paperwork for the finance app the dealer submitted to the bank. Oftentimes, when you submit a finance application at a dealership, the dealership will take the hand-filled out application and reproduce it electronically. This is pretty normal. However, on the application the dealer submitted to the bank, the dealer said my friend was a GM of the McDonald's and made $70,000. My friend had good credit, so it doesn't appear like the bank asked for proof of income. So I go to the dealership with my friend and tell the sales manager he's going to want to put me in touch with the GM because we were going to be unwinding my friend's deal and giving his trade-in back. The sales manager thought I was joking. The general manager also thought I was joking. Then I demonstrated how his dealership's finance department committed bank fraud. I showed the GM the finance app my friend filled out. I then showed the GM the finance app his dealership submitted to the bank and pointed at the income difference. My friend really made $14,000 a year. The dealership claimed my friend made $70,000 a year. That's bank fraud. That's a felony. Let's keep this simple, shall we? The GM sees his dealership is in a load of crap. The proof I am presenting to him is rock solid. He knows it. I know it. We are all on the same page. He goes, okay, so what can I do to make this right? I go, unwind the deal, give my friend his trade in back. Unwinding the deal is basically the GM agreeing to cancel the deal and basically erasing the deal and pretending it never happened. GM tries to avoid that, but I remain firm and remind him we can easily take this documentation and turn his life into a living heck. He knows I'm right. My friend also needs a car to get to work the next day. The GM says he'll check into it. He comes back and tells me, unfortunately, they sold his trade-in already. I said, that's fine. Unwind the deal and let's put my friend into something as good or slightly better than what he traded in for. So the GM goes, so he'll buy a car similar to his trade-in? I said, no, you'll give him a car similar to his trade-in. The GM goes, it doesn't work that way. I go, it does when you commit bank fraud. GM is upset with me. I remind him, I'm being really nice, and this situation can totally get really ugly. Like, felony level charges ugly. Like, losing your franchise ugly. So, yeah, this is going to hurt, but it's going to hurt less my way. So the GM goes, alright, and he looks into his inventory and tells me they have a 2007 Focus with 10,000 more miles. I tell him, no, the car you give my friend needs to be the same or better than what he traded in. The GM counters, I'm giving him a free car. And I go, no, you took in his trade, you sold it, you made money on that sale, you also committed a felony in the process of selling him his new car, you are now correcting that mistake. This isn't a free car for my friend, this is a, you are correcting your mistake. 
GM insists that's what he's willing to do, and I tell him if he can't do better than that, we will go to a consumer protection attorney and have a conversation with them. My friend didn't want to go this route, but it was our plan B. We go to get up, the GM says, wait, give me a second. The GM goes, I have an 08 Civic, it has 5k more miles, but it's a Civic, not a Focus. I unwind the deal on the new car, you put your friend in the Civic at no extra cost. We agree. GM has the paper drawn up, the old loan on the new car is cancelled, they take in the new car again, but because it's already titled, they'll have to sell it as used, that sucks for them. And they gave my friend a better car than the one he traded in. For people asking why we didn't get a lawyer involved from the start, we could have done that, but courts take a long time, and this was a faster way to fix the situation. Okay OP, I can understand that you wanted a fast way to fix this situation, but unfortunately, the dealer is going to do this again to someone else, probably that same day, if you don't report this to the proper authorities. I would definitely still take that paperwork, and I'd go straight to the media with it. I mean, yes, you can go to the proper authorities and they'll get a fine and maybe possibly get their dealership shut down, but probably not, and they'll still be able to do this to other people. If you go to the media and it gets out to millions of people in the local area, well, you're going to tank their business. That's a better way to take them down. In the end, I guess you got what you want, but I just can't help but feel that you could have gotten so much more. Our next story today comes to us from Neither Glove 4355 Brother ruined my wedding by proposing, so I ruined his proposal. Let's jump right in. I, 35 male, have a younger brother Todd, 29 male, who had a complicated birth and had to stay a month in the ICU. And because of that, my parents have always doted on him and almost denied him nothing, even if it was to the detriment of my sister Abby, 32 female, and I. My brother drinks in on the attention and has on more than one occasion made himself the center of attention at either my, my sister's, or a cousin's special event. Because of this, Abby and I have a strained relationship with Todd and our parents. Unfortunately, Todd met and fell in love with Lucy, 24 female, who announced her own pregnancy at the baby shower my mom held for Abby. When I proposed to my wife, Michelle, 30 female, I just wanted to elope, but she really wanted her family to be there, so I invited my family out of obligation. While out, my best man Jim, 35 male, noticed a receipt from a jewelry store slipped out of Todd's pocket. Jim confronted Todd about this, which led to an argument. Jim told me everything and I told Todd that he was no longer going to be a groomsman because I knew he was going to propose at my wedding. Todd cried to our parents and which led to a blowout. In my parents' eyes, since Todd never admitted that he was going to propose to Lucy at my wedding, I was unfairly judging him. I refused and brought up Todd's past behavior. My parents couldn't refute this and got Todd to agree not to try anything at my wedding. This wasn't enough to convince me to let him be a groomsman, but I warned him that if, as a guest, he'd try anything, I would make him regret it. Fast forward to the wedding and surprise, surprise, Todd walked over to Lucy and proposed to her during Michelle's father-daughter dance and did it in a way so that everyone would notice. Cue my revenge. Jim and I had hired a woman to pretend to be Todd's side piece who cornered Todd and Lucy and claimed that she was pregnant with his baby. Todd denied this, but when she called his phone, I gave her his number and messed with Todd's phone to incriminate him. It didn't look good. Lucy threw the ring back at Todd and left in tears. When Todd saw the smile on my face, he knew that it was me, and I didn't respond to a single call or text from him or my parents until after the honeymoon. Lucy has thrown Todd's stuff out and has been denying access to their kid. Todd is furious and is demanding that I clear his name. I sent him a text saying that I had no idea what he was talking about, as well as a screenshot of a bill for the wedding and gave a vague message demanding reimbursement for half of the wedding costs. Michelle knew the whole time what I was planning and gave me the green light after Todd ruined her moment with her dad. So I felt pretty good, but now even Abby thinks I went too far. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Is It Supposed To Do That? that says, Your family is effed up. There's another comment right below that one from a user called Life With No Filter 
that says, like, really effed up. Would not want to be involved in a relationship dynamic like that, jeez. And one more below that from the Jace, it says, yeah, I've met some effed up families, but why do these people even still talk to each other? They would all be better off just by cutting each other out of their lives. This all goes back to a thing that I've heard before and I firmly believe you can't choose your biological relatives, but you can choose your family. You honestly have no obligation to keep these people in your life if you don't want to. We all need to remember that if you step back and look at it, life is extremely short. And what's the point of going through it dealing with crap like that all the time when you could just cut them out and have a much better life because of it? Sometimes you just need to do things that benefit yourself, or in the case of OP, benefit yourself and your new wife and any kids you may have in the future. Our next story today comes to us from Dean of GCC. How I got my landlord arrested for auto theft. Let's jump right in. I used to live in a rental townhome. The place was great. It was run by a big company, but they paid an on-site super to run the office, coordinate repairs, etc. When I moved in, it was this nice older retired couple. Few years later, they moved on and the company hired these two young dudes. They were buttholes. Recent college grads who looked down on the blue collar tenants, did loud parties all night, generally ignored the grounds, ignored maintenance requests, etc. But that's not how I got them arrested. In addition to renting the townhouse, you could rent a covered spot. If you did, they gave you a hang tag, and if you didn't have the hang tag, you'd get towed. I had the same car, same spot, and same tag the whole time I lived there. One day, I come out and my car is gone. It was towed for no hang tag, but in the pictures, the tow company took, it's clearly there. I paid to get it out and complained to the two idiots. They had to call to authorize a tow, company couldn't just do it on their own. They gave me a half butt apology. About a week later, same problem. Again, towed for no tag. Again, tags right there. This time, I called the corporate office and complained. After that, it started happening nearly every day. When I talked to the supers about it, they'd just laugh. I knew they were doing it on purpose, so I did some research. The tow company gave me the names of the people who called it in, and it was mostly one guy, but some the other. The tow company wasn't liable because the landlords had called them, so that was out. But I did some research and found out that in my state, Calling for a tow, when you know it's not a legal tow, is Grand Theft Auto, just like if you broke into a car. I also found out you can record conversations in my state without telling the other person. So I went in to meet the two bros to talk about the situation. They told me, on tape, that the first two times were mistakes, but after that they did it on purpose and would keep doing so until I learned my lesson. They stated that they knew I was okay to park there, but they didn't care. I took that recording and the list of calls to a buddy who's an attorney, and he helped me take it to the local police. Police were more than happy to have a couple felony charges dropped into their laps, so they filed charges and went to arrest them. Corporate fired them the same day, refunded all of my fees for getting my car out of Hawk, and gave me a rental discount for a few months. They both ended up eating the felony and got probation. Last I heard, they weren't able to find decent jobs because of the felonies and also couldn't pay their student loans. Both ended up working construction, which they'd sneered at because that's all they had left. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Photonics Guy. It says, so if they kept on getting the car towed, were they charged with multiple thefts of the same vehicle or just a single theft? OP responded to this comment and said, each tow was a separate charge. The cops were happy that they said the first two were mistakes, but the rest were deliberate because they each got hit with all the counts they called in on. I think one guy got seven and the other got three. They each pled down to one. I'm guessing in this case that OP actually did the corporate company a favor by getting these people charged. I'm sure they had many complaints about what these people were doing, but didn't have anything rock solid that they could fire them over and were just waiting for that one thing to come in where they could say, yep, that's enough and get those two guys out of there. One final point though about the two guys now being in the construction business, you know, something that they sneered at previously. 
Do you think they're going to do a good enough job there as well? Would you want to live or work in something they built? <laughs> I don't think so. Our next story today comes to us from RaditzFan9000. Terrorize my family? Enjoy losing everything and going back to jail. Let's jump right in. Myself and my wife had just had our second child and moved into a duplex in an amazing neighborhood. Had its own playground even. We moved in and greeted the neighbors, bunch of younger people, but they seemed okay. The first day after moving in, we find that they're gone and they've left their seven-year-old on a school day outside our door with a bag of goldfish and a note asking us to watch him while they went out. Cue CPS call number one. The neighbors and me got along really well. Old guy next door repaired bikes for a hobby and the next door neighbor did woodworking and would always come over to see the kids and sent his grandkids over to play too. They warned us that our upstairs neighbors were trouble, constant traffic going in and out and parties every single night. This was 110% the truth. It got to the point where we couldn't sleep at night and we had multiple altercations to the point it was full blown yelling matches. The landlord was useless and would do nothing to get rid of them. So I bided my time. Eventually one night, they came home in their red Mazda 3 and it was destroyed. They must have hit someone and ran. So I called the RCMP to let them know, as at the very least, I would figured they'd get in deep crap. But oh man, I had no idea what I just unleashed. Turns out the douchebag had a warrant out for his arrest for illicit substance trafficking. He got hauled away in cuffs that night and Entitled Woman 2 got a visit from CPS again as they left their son home alone again. This wasn't once or twice, it was every single day. So my wife went digging for names and found the mother on Facebook. Using public record searches, we found out that they owed Easy Home nearly $48,000 in assets as they had taken off from the original address with all of their furniture, including TVs and a huge sound system. 48 hours later, the sheriff was there with a box truck emptying their house, took the beds, couches, TVs, the annoying subwoofer system, kitchen set, and even the dressers. CPS came shortly after and removed the child from the house. I didn't enjoy seeing him taken away, but they never fed him and he was always in the same clothing and it was falling apart. We went out of our way to make sure he had full meals when we could, not gonna let a kid starve. The douchebag went to jail for illicit substance possession. He was out on bail and hid the substances in a dresser they took. Entitled Woman 1 went to jail for assaulting the sheriff and Entitled Woman 2 actually had a happy ending. Far as I know, after she lost her son, she went through multiple programs to clean herself up and started working to provide for her son. Ran into her a couple years ago and she thanked me for what I did. I got pro revenge on the illicit substances dealer and his girlfriend and thankfully helped someone get on the right path. Okay, so one thing here, I used to work for Easy Home and I can tell you for sure that we never would have given out 40 something thousand dollars worth of stuff to one family. That just wouldn't happen. It wouldn't matter how high your income was, that just wouldn't happen. Even if you outfit a complete apartment with appliances, bedroom sets, dining room stuff, and basically anything else that Easy Home offered, I would hazard a guess that you wouldn't get above 15 grand. But that's neither here nor there. OP, it sounds to me like you were trying to do the best thing for the kid in this situation. And that gets some massive respect from me. Not too many stories we have on here end up with the recipient of the revenge coming back to thank you in the end and turning their lives around. So that was a welcome surprise. Thank you, OP. Our next story today comes to us from Hunting the Wumpus. They screwed me out of my pay, I screwed them out of their company. Let's jump right in. Many years ago, I got a job with a marketing company during phone deregulation. It was the wild west and a lot of small long distance companies sprang up, all trying to get a piece of the pie. Eventually, they all got bought up by the bigger fish, but at that time, they were all paying hired gun marketing firms very well to score contracts for them to lock people in. I got a job with one of those marketing firms, a new age capitalism company that insisted we all do yoga and breathing exercises while they rang a little bell and gave us affirmations about how many contracts we were all going to sell and how much money we'd all make. 
The job was 100% commission, but I was always good at sales, so I looked at the pay scale and noticed that it was exponential, presumably to entice people to work hard with impossible payouts. We were allowed to work as many or as few hours as we wanted, with the payout based on your weekly sales numbers. I decided I would give it a shot for one week to see how much I could realistically make before deciding whether I was willing to put up with the tasteless vegan snacks and mandatory voluntary yoga regime. For the next week, I pushed myself as hard as I could. For seven straight days, I worked 14 plus hour days every single day and used every trick and technique I had learned doing sales to score as many contracts as I possibly could. I figured this would tell me my maximum possible income and could decide on that basis whether to stay. At the end of the week, I had blown everyone else out of the water. In fact, I had not just gotten more contracts than anyone there had ever seen in a week, I had gotten more than any of them had seen in a month. Because of the exponential scale, I realized that I was making absolutely ridiculous amounts of money, $10,000 plus a week. They had never experienced anyone who could actually hit those kinds of numbers. Coming in the next week expecting a huge payday, I ended up with about 5% of what I expected. They told me there were problems with a lot of my contracts and that I would be allowed to fix them and submit them a few at a time over the next several weeks. These problems were things like an apostrophe wasn't quite clear or the dash in someone's phone number was slightly crooked. They were going to screw me. That night, I got a phone call from the company's office manager, Frank, who wanted to meet up for a drink. Curious, I agreed. Over beers, Frank told me that the owners of the company were in a panic because I would have bankrupted them. He said they spread out all my contracts on the floor of the office, then they crawled over them, inspecting each one and trying to figure out if I was committing some kind of fraud. When they comprehended that all my contracts were legit, they decided they had no choice but to screw me over. Frank told me he realized at that point that if they would screw me, they'd screw him too. And besides, he was tired of doing yoga. He asked me if I would be interested in going into business with him and go head to head with his bosses. I thought it sounded intriguing, but I asked him how he thought we could compete. Frank explained that he had found out they didn't actually have the contract for our city. They were acting as independent contractors for another company who had the contract to market the service in an entirely different city. They were poaching here because the person who did have the contract wasn't actively using it. We put together a pitch and approached the guy with the real contract, Joe, and told him about the people poaching his turf. We agreed that we'd split it with him. We'd take the upfront money for each contract and he'd get the back end money down the road. It was a good deal for everyone. So Joe contacted the phone company and had them threaten the poachers with a big lawsuit if they didn't stop. A week later, Frank and I strolled into the offices of our old employer. Most of the furniture and all of the yoga mats were gone and there was just a table, a couple of filing cabinets and a file box with the final pay envelopes for everyone. I made a show of counting my money to make sure it was all there. And the two owners, husband and wife, told Frank and I bitterly that they'd had to take cash advances on their credit cards for this money and asked me if I felt guilty for destroying their lives. I smiled, said nope, and left. Our marketing company made us a lot of money over the year until the company got bought up by Sprint and the gravy train ended. Ah yes, corporate jargon, mandatory voluntary, otherwise known as voluntold or recommendatory. <laughs> Down in the comment section for this one, there's one from a user called Tasharella. It says, why wouldn't you sue them for the $10,000? It seems like you had a very solid case and you would have been able to get a no win, no fee for that. As in, sue them for the stolen wages as well as destroying their company. You absolutely could have done that. Why didn't you? OP responded to this one and said, I was an independent contractor. That's the only way they could get away with paying only on commission. There was also the problem that out of spite, they stole all those contracts. I still had the contact information so I could go back and get the forms re-signed from the customers, but I had no real evidence it happened. And I certainly wasn't going to spend thousands on a lawyer to sue people who were running a business on credit card cash advances and were probably close to broke anyway. 
I'd say in this case, OP did a pretty darn good job of getting revenge anyway. In fact, I think OP got really lucky that the office manager wanted to screw the company too. Our next story today comes to us from Top Professional 69 My boss suspended me for his negligence, so I ruined his life. Let's jump right in. For a little context, I work at a vape shop which is already in a rough space due to regulations and laws the government is putting on us. Due to this, we were well aware that certain products we sold and made were highly illegal and enforceable at any time. I, 25 male, have been working at my job for a little over a year and a half. The owner of the company is the one who hired me, and she was the biggest sweetheart in the world. Unfortunately, she was forced out of her company by her son. He is the type of person who believes that he is always right, and if you don't agree with him, he will completely ignore you or fire you. He literally forced his mom into retirement by threatening to, um, hurt himself, and continues to use that card every time she even says she wants to come visit. Last winter, we had a massive snowstorm. Getting to work was rough, but we were told that we had to come anyway. We get there and the snow isn't plowed from the parking lot because he didn't want to pay the guy to do it, so we had to. Due to the lot being absolutely massive, we couldn't get it all done in time for us to help customers. As they came and went, we noticed the snow being padded down to the ground and essentially turning into a slip and slide. Of course, he didn't do anything about it and asked me and another co-worker to clear all the garbage out of the other side of the building. When I did, I slipped and hurt myself. I didn't file for workers comp, but told them I'd need to rest myself while at work. The next shift, I sat almost the entire shift and because I couldn't do anything, I sat on my phone only to get up to help customers. The next day, my manager tells me he got out of a meeting with the owner's son, and I was suspended for a week, five shifts. As I'm a college student and rent an apartment and have car payments, I couldn't afford to lose five days of pay. I marched into his office and laid it out that either he fires me so I can collect unemployment or unsuspend me. He told me that neither was happening and that he was going to use me as an example to the rest of the employees. I was pissed and cursed him out. He doesn't like confrontation, so he shortened my suspension to get me out of the office. He then treated me poorly and singled me out for everything everyone else also does. But I was the only one being punished. Then comes the fact that he wanted to reconcile by forcing me to do handyman work around the place and didn't give me the tools, equipment, or training to do or use any of these objectives. This was the tipping point for me. The revenge. Due to being constantly singled out, I came to learn that everyone else was unhappy with this fact. I learned all the dirty little secrets about the company, including illegal products, labor violations, tax violations, etc. I used these secrets that I learned to call multiple government agencies, FDA, OSHA, DOL, and report him by name. First, OSHA came and did an inspection on my day off. He told everyone they only cited him for a small violation, and he was good other than that. I was obviously angry at that, but a few weeks later, I got a packet in the mail telling me he got cited for everything and he was getting massive fines. I then get called into the office again with the manager who told me I was suspended. He proceeded to tell my manager that he was getting demoted for not writing me up more and that I was no longer getting my raise until I fixed my attitude. This of course was right after he said, I don't care that you called OSHA. This little act is known as retaliation, which is illegal to do to people who called a protected agency like OSHA. He refused to even look at me at this point because if he did anything, that would imply he was punishing me for calling OSHA. I would have a lawsuit to destroy him. Now to today, another day off for me and I get a text from a coworker at 11 a.m. That message was, FDA is here, the manager quit and it's crazy. The FDA and IRS came rolling in full force in black trucks and SUVs. They came in and raided the place, seizing all illegal products and all the paperwork pertaining to the business. They're still there as I write this, so hopefully there will be more to come, but knowing how this works out in most cases, I won't have a job much longer and will be on unemployment. OP added an edit on at the bottom of the story it says, The ATF also showed up. They confiscated all the house-made juices. 
we apparently don't have a manufacturing license. None of us knew this, and that means we may no longer be able to sell products. The IRS showed up because there's a possible case for an investigation into tax evasion. As I learn more, I will continue to update. And update OP did, we have update number two. It says, It seems as though through talks with the lawyer, the son decided to actually take the heat for all of it and is going to have to pay massive fines and is possibly looking at jail time. He likely won't ever be able to get a manufacturing license for the rest of his life. And they said, essentially, that he won't be able to open any new businesses. I know he had two new locations rented out and in the process of opening, and those are never going to happen now. They're raiding his other business today, and that's going to be interesting, considering that if he doesn't have the paperwork for that business, it could lead to much more jail time. So as of right now, even though my job isn't shutting down yet, his other business is getting raided. He can't open the two locations that he's put a crap ton of money and time into, and he's going to be fined all he's worth and possibly go to jail. I will continue to update. Down in the comment section for this one, there was some really solid advice for OP from a user called Burnt Jelly Toast. <laughs> in the future, always write up an incident report if you get injured at work. Even if it's minor at the time, the injury can get worse in the following days. It protects both you and the company. OP responded to this one and said there was an incident report. The injury wasn't that large, just required me to sit down for a few shifts, so I didn't apply for workers' comp. Another user called Script responded to this and said, Always, always let a doctor decide that. Never assume anything when it comes to work injuries. This is so true. Get everything documented as much as you can. Even go and see a doctor in that case, even if you're not feeling all that bad. I mean, you were bad enough that you needed light duties for a few shifts. That means you should go see the doctor because you never know what's going to come up in the future. Having that doctor visit on your record and the reasoning for that visit could mean the difference in the future of having a claim versus not having a claim. Also, OP, make sure you follow up with the IRS because they generally do have a whistleblower fee that they pay out, which is typically around 10% of whatever they collect back from the person that was being dishonest on their taxes. It sounds to me from what you said that you're living paycheck to paycheck, so that's something you might really want to follow up on. Our next story today comes to us from Leading Road 8119. Bully tries to act like it was in school? Guess I will tell on you then. Let's jump right in. In secondary school, I was tormented by a specific bully. For years, I was beaten up and publicly humiliated on a daily basis. The worst thing he did was beat me up so bad that I got a concussion and broken ribs when I was 14. He never faced consequences in school because his family was rich and he was pretty popular. For context, I live in a pretty small town in England, so everyone knows everyone, including the bully. He left school when I was 17 and I didn't see him for about a year. Around this time, I got way more popular and started going to parties and making more friends. And annoyingly, he was friends with some of my friends and his girlfriend was at my school. But I managed to avoid him mostly until I finished school. Unfortunately, I saw him a few months later. Me and my friends went to the pub to celebrate our exam results and he was a complete butthole to me. Started insulting me and mocking me to my friends saying, Why do you hang out with OP? bringing up a bunch of stuff from years ago, and at one point put me in a headlock and told me that my friends only hung out with me out of pity. I wasn't going to take it, but I also wasn't going to get into a punch-up because I didn't want to give him the satisfaction of getting me angry. And right at that moment, I overheard the perfect thing. He was bragging to his friends about the house party he was having and saying about all the illicit substances he was going to take to the party and said he had it all in his car. It wasn't just a bit of green either if I remember correctly. He said he had 13 bags of sugar <laughs> and a bunch of other substances. And then I knew what I would do for my revenge on the guy. As he was leaving, I followed him to his car and took a photo of his number plate. Then after he was driving off, I walked off and called the police. I knew they needed something more than hearsay to stop the car, especially because I didn't want to be traced back to it. So I told the police I saw my bully doing a white powder in the pub toilets. This was a complete fabrication and then get into the driver's side of the car. I then provided them with the license plate of the car and told them the direction they were heading in. 
I honestly didn't think they were going to stop him, or maybe they would ask him questions later and ruin his party, but the driving on illicit substances allegation plus the fact he had been arrested for minor possession before, which I didn't know at the time, was enough for the police to take it seriously, and stop and search his car. And they found all the illicit substances he was transporting to his party, and he got arrested for it. The consequences of his arrest meant he lost out on his university place. His rich parents had enough of his behavior, so kicked him out and cut him off from their funds. And a rumor I heard was that in turn for a lower sentence, my bully ratted out his supplier, which resulted in him getting hurt. And as a consequence of that, now has to wear a colostomy bag. And his criminal record means he is currently unemployed. OP, I can tell you from personal experience, it takes a really long time to get over being bullied when you're younger. I still have some issues with it, and I'm 41. One thing you have that I don't, though, is that you know that your bully got what was coming to him, because your bully was a total shitbag, both inside and out. <laughs> Our next story today comes to us from Morbid Moth 42 Franchise owner told me I was a nobody who should know her place. He doesn't have a business now. Let's jump right in. Got hired to be the manager and completely run a frozen yogurt shop after working at a different location that had different owners for years. I was promised a great pay and complete control. I get there and it was a train wreck. The type of yogurt they sold, you take a powdered base, mix with milk and add flavors. The workers were just pouring straight milk in the machines. The floors under the machines literally had never been cleaned. I found an anthill under the cold topping cooler, found mold in multiple machines. They didn't have a blender to mix the yogurt or a recipe chart for employees. The owners also owned a subway, so the only knives they had were dull subway knives. They had no gloves or cleaning supplies of any kind besides dish soap. I worked my butt off cleaning the store, literally spent hours with a razor scraping the years of yogurt off the floor. The owner fussed at me for doing unnecessary things on the clock, and demanded I clock out if I wanted to do that. He also only kept four employees at a time at the store, and tried to make them all work at the subway too, so that he could just pay them that way. I refused. One of the employees he had when I got there was literally 14. The state I lived in allowed that, but had very strict rules about it. Like, they can't work before 7am or after 7pm, they need to have a 30 minute break every 4 hours, etc. He had made the schedule and I noticed he had her there alone for 6 hours. I go in on my day off to order toppings, and then told her she needed to clean, not just sit on her phone the whole time. She got annoyed with me, but finally did it. Then I come out of the office, clock in, and tell her she has to take a 30 minute break. She goes off on me and I'm like, look kid, it's the law. She called the owner about it and he immediately yelled at me that I was no one and had no authority. I had no right to make her clock out and I needed to understand my place. So the next day I opened. I cleaned all the machines, filled them with cleaner water, not yogurt, and put them to wash cycle. I mopped the awful floor, took out the trash, then went into the office and typed up a sign with pictures I had taken of all the disgusting things I had seen and since fixed. I printed it out, taped it to the door on the inside so it couldn't be ripped off, locked the door, slid my keys under it, blocked the owner, and left. The sign read, Dear Customers, I apologize for the inconvenience, due to the owner, owner's full name, believing this is an acceptable way to keep the store, and that cleaning this is unnecessary, I, a nobody who should know her place, have decided you deserve to know the disgusting state of this store, prior to my employment. The store will remain closed until he tricks someone else to manage it for minimum wage after promising $18 an hour. Feel free to speak to the owner at the subway across the shopping center. I don't recommend eating there though. I have also contacted the Department of Health and the Department of Labor for his illegal hiring of a minor without following the law and his demand that all workers here also work at the subway, so he only has to pay us subway checks with yogurt shop name hours added on. Corporate of both, Frozen Yogurt Chain and Subway have also been contacted over the multiple contract violations the owner has done. Apologies again for the inconvenience. If you still would like a cold sweet treat, I recommend name of ice cream shop nearby. <laughs> 
the yogurt shop and his subway got closed down. OP added some extra info down at the bottom. It says, more info for those who wanted to know more about the hot mess. I did know going in that it wasn't going to be super great. My old location had gotten several bad reviews from people who had visited this location and thought they were the same people not understanding how franchises work. Like I said, whenever I got hired, he only had four employees there at a time, so he fired someone to hire me. The two other employees that were not minors were annoyed with me just because of that. Whenever I got there, none of the employees knew how to cut fruit properly. I'm talking, they were serving pineapple with the core and sometimes part of the peel still there. They didn't have gloves at first and weren't even washing their hands. So I made them wash their hands before messing with the fruit and then went to the guy's subway and got gloves after fighting him about it. I was going to just buy some, but he wanted me to use those. Most of the knives were rusty or just outright completely dull and useless. Have you ever tried to cut a pineapple with a dull, super small bread knife? It's not very easy. The employees that he had whenever I got there didn't even know they were supposed to add the yogurt powder to it and didn't have containers to mix it all in. There were no measuring cups of any kind. I went to the store, got good knives, not overpriced ones, but you know, better than Subway ones, then had a mandatory store meeting where I showed all of them how to cut fruit properly. I bought containers to mix the yogurt in, measuring cups and labels for them to put in the fridge, and taught them how to do that. Went through all the stock and inventory, and threw away most of the stuff because it was expired. To which the owner got mad at me for throwing it away and wasting his money. Because of the store's small staff many nights, I would have to close by myself and be required to clock out at a certain time, even if the store wasn't ready. The owner only gave me 15 to 30 minutes to clean and close the store. For reference, my other location was about an hour with at least two people. Because of that requirement, I would have my boyfriend at the time help me, that way I would not take hours unpaid doing work. I used my own money to buy all the cleaning supplies. In total, I worked there for almost two months, the owner kept promising that my pay raise would come soon, I just had to show that I was going to stay there first, which now I realize was a huge red flag. But I was freshly 19 and just excited to save the store, because I knew if I had the time and resources, I could get that store up to par with my other location. I also had the owner curse me out for denying a lady to use a coupon, which was very obviously fake, telling me I should have just taken it anyway. The coupon was for 75% off your total order, and she had rung up like $100 worth of yogurt. I'm sure there's other stuff that I'll try to remember, but that's all I have for right now. Hope that adds to the satisfaction of the owner getting his just desserts. Down in the comment section for this one, OP was asked a pretty important question from a user called ENL951. It says, wait, you deep cleaned the whole store, then quit? I mean, great work ethic, but I don't think I'd give the guy any more labor at that point. OP responded to this comment and said, I didn't want the thousands of dollars worth of machines getting messed up from having yogurt in them without being ran. They would have frozen to a solid block of ice and broke the machines. And honestly, I just couldn't stand the look of the store as filthy as it was. I figured I'd give them one last clean slate. So both of these places that OP worked for, Subway and this yogurt shop, seem like they're franchised locations of really large corporate companies. So I can see that on their way out, OP wouldn't want to sabotage that location anymore, especially if they want to stay in the good books of that company because obviously the message on the door is going to get back to people higher up in the company and they'll know exactly why OP left. There's a good chance that OP could get another job within this company, whether back at the location that they worked at before or somewhere else and burning bridges, well, that just doesn't help. Our next story today comes to us from Reaper0221. It is a really bad idea to make a government employee angry. Let's jump right in. This one is a double government employee event and what you should know is if you get the attention of a government employee and make them angry, they will make your life a living heck. The setup is that I was working for a local county government in the permitting department that handled drainage and floodplain enforcement. I received a complaint from a homeowner, nice guy, lived next door to a house that was part of an incorporated village, not nice guy. 
Nice Guy lived in an unincorporated portion of the county, and hence the call to me as an agent of the county. I drove out to the site and to investigate and discovered some interesting facts. The permitting agent for the village allowed the incorporated homeowner to fill his lot, effecting the drainage which caused the unincorporated lot to flood every time there was anything more than light rain. Nice Guy indicated that there was some tension between him and Not Nice Guy, and part of the issue was that Nice Guy and his partner were a gay couple. This ran up a red flag for me, but in trying to be impartial, I took the information and some photos for the file and indicated that I would contact the village to find a resolution. I wrote a letter and then called the village inspector, Jack Wagon, to discuss. I was told by Jack Wagon that the village could do as it pleased and that I could do nothing to stop Not Nice Guy from doing as they pleased, as it was approved by the village. There was then a comment about those type of people, the gay couple, making complaints just to cause trouble. I was now on the case, and it was time to make sure everything done on the incorporated lot was 100% legal. At this point, the game certainly was now on, because if there's one thing that grinds my gears, it is bullying. I went back out and spoke to Nice Guy and let them know what I was up to, and also that I was not going to let this slide. I then started investigating the elevations on the two lots, and what fill had been placed on the incorporated lot. The not nice guy came out and started getting belligerent about my presence and ongoing investigation. He incorrectly stated that I did not have jurisdiction over his lot and that he would be calling the police. I patiently listened and then pulled out my two-way radio and requested that the home base dispatch both a village and a county police unit to the location. I then indicated that since there was a regulatory floodplain on his lot, I did in fact have jurisdiction and that I would be exercising my right to determine the impact of his fill activities upon that floodplain. Both of the police units showed up and I let them know what was going on. They were both appropriately agitated to have to waste their time and let Not Nice Guy know that I was within my authority to proceed with the investigation. A little while later, while I was measuring things, Jack Wagon showed up. He started berating me about harassing the village resident and threatening calling my boss and filing a complaint and so forth. I invited him to do so, quoting which parts of the code he could indicate I was violating. I was using marking paint to show the limits of the floodplain for the photos for the file, and what do you know, Jack Wagon's shoe got painted when he tried to stop me. Obviously, he was even more angry as was the homeowner due to very bright orange paint in the grass in his yard. I pointed out I had done the same on the neighboring lots, but they just kept complaining. It was actually marking chalk that comes off pretty easily. Interestingly, I found two really wrong things on Not Nice Guy's lot. Number one, there was fill placed in the floodplain, and two, a garden shed was built on the fill and partially within the floodplain. Both are big no-no and are actually against federal law. So the course of action had two parts. One, make the incorporated homeowner remove the fill and shed from the floodplain, and two, let Nice Guy place fill in their lot outside of the floodplain to counteract the fill remaining in Not Nice Guy's lot outside of the floodplain. I also told Nice Guy it would be a good idea to run a field tile on their side to drain the water that would inevitably pond up between the two lots when it rained. Predictably, Not Nice Guy and Jack Wagon got super angry when I sent the letter out that there were violations that either had to be corrected, remove fill and shed, or apply for a revision of the floodplain with the Army Corps of Engineers. Good luck with that. This then led to a meeting at the county office with Not Nice Guy, Jack Wagon, my supervisor, and myself. Quickly, things went to 11, and there was yelling by Jack Wagon about the abuse of power, etc. The department head came into the conference room and told them both they were wrong and that they should leave peacefully and comply or face the consequences, fines. The best part was that Not Nice Guy had to apply for a permit and guess who was the one to review and approve it? That's right, yours truly. Now, I was following the letter of the law, but you have to know that poor government workers are underpaid and overworked. Strangely, the permit for Nice Guy was almost immediately approved while Not Nice Guy had to have a very thorough review to ensure it was correct. 
You could make a case I was abusing my power, but I can assure you that the timing for their review was well within acceptable limits. Also, how could I be held to account that they misfiled three times before they finally got it right? Generally, if you behaved like a civil human and came to the office, we would help you get things done properly, so the permit would go through first time. But not nice guy decided he could do it all on his own, so it took him three tries. Had he come to the office, I would have given him the same services as others, but he decided to take the hard route, and therefore, I didn't give a single inch when it came to the submission being perfectly correct. Ultimately, the situation was resolved, but it took a lot more effort than it should have. Moral of the story, don't be an entitled homophobic butthole. Jumping down in the comment section for this one, there's one from a user called Seagull321. It says, you weren't abusing power. You had to make sure not nice neighbor didn't do anything sneaky and against code. Cause it was likely he'd try. OP responded to this one and said, that was clearly the case. And the inspector from the village was enabling him to keep doing so. Basically, they thought they could keep abusing the neighbor without consequences, and they were definitely wrong. Yeah, what these people need to learn is that manners cost nothing, but they can save you a fortune. Not nice neighbor would have been able to save a ton of money if they'd just been willing to communicate with the nice neighbor over the issue. I guess what we learned from this story though is that not nice neighbor isn't a good person, and sometimes there's just no hope for somebody like that. Our last story today comes to us from Uncommon Optimist. Cheat on me and brag to your friends? Enjoy deportation. Let's jump right in. I met this girl, 22 at the time, while I, 30 male at the time, was working in a national park, and she was a housekeeper on a work visa. We instantly hit it off, and within a month, we were in a relationship. We even had a solid long distance arrangement where we would visit each other on recreational visas in our respective off seasons. I'd spend a few months in Romania or meet her at some vacation destination, then she'd spend a few months in the States. Her marrying and moving to the US meant that her mom wouldn't have to worry about her daughter having a good life. I arranged for sponsorship and proposed to her. It seemed like my dreams were coming true. Then, about a month after she's all settled in, I get a message from her best friend back home. What followed was a year's worth of screenshots wherein she bragged about conning me into paying for her residency, while she cheated on me with eight different men. In her friend's words, you are a good man and you don't deserve this. So over the following two weeks, I reported her to ICE and Homeland Security for a conversation her brother and I had over a bottle at one point. He bragged about how he had done time in prison for smuggling pew-pews to Turkish terrorists and how she had been his lookout on several occasions. As you might imagine, in the War on Terror days, this was not taken lightly. She was immediately arrested and deported and put on a permanent no-entry terror watch list. Want to take advantage of me and cheat? Have fun never being able to come back to the States. Edited to address potential misinformation on my part, I'm not very well versed in European sociopolitics, so I was under the impression that her past, along with her brothers, would result in as much difficulty as it did here. I was misinformed, so thanks to everyone who set the record straight as far as her job prospects overseas. Down in the comment section for this one, a user called Biolust said to OP, you should sponsor her best friend just to rub it in her face some more. OP responded to this one and said, you know, we joked about it too. She said that if she wasn't already married, she'd do it just to spite her. My question is, does this not sound like a today I effed up post by dating someone eight years younger than me and expecting them to want to settle down and not just use me for a green card? Our next story today comes to us from Bakatari, Military Revenge Served Hot. Let's jump right in. Back in my army days, I was once in command of a unit of about 80 soldiers in Hawaii. Dialogue sections are the gist of what was said, but it's been a minute, so they're not exact. Names changed, etc. Most of the soldiers in my command were great people, happy to do their jobs and take home a paycheck. Hard workers, creative, adaptable to unusual army conditions, and generally reliable. But there was one who was trouble from the start. Gentle reader, meet Private Wiggles. My first awareness of Wiggles came two or three days after I'd taken over command of the unit. 
we were prepping for a month-long training exercise to Thailand, and Platoon Sergeant Maggie tells me Wiggles might not be able to go as she just had an outpatient medical procedure. Departure is about a week away, and I have to validate the personnel roster to make sure we've got logistical support for everyone we're bringing. Transportation, food, lodging, etc. So I talk directly with Wiggles and ask if she's okay to travel and participate in the exercise. Wiggles says it's not a problem, she can handle it. We get to Thailand and set up camp in a Thai army base. Two days in, and the medical section sends a runner to find me. Wiggles is at our medical clinic, tents with cots and surprisingly extensive medical supplies, laid out with extreme abdominal pain. I cruise over to the clinic tent, and the physician assistant, on duty, tells me a couple things. Wiggles acknowledged recently having an abortion, the previously mentioned outpatient medical procedure, and the PA's examination and testing shows that Wiggles has the single worst case of pelvic inflammatory disease he's ever seen. Seriously, this army PA, who has seen all sorts of crazy crap from soldiers, was emphatically impressed by how bad it was. Wiggles developed PID from failing to get treatment for STIs for a long, long, long time. As in, she's almost glowing from it. No judgment on the abortion, not everyone is ready for kids. And the STI-induced PID can be treated with high-dose antibiotics, which the PA has on hand. Not a problem, we've got this covered. Wiggles is released to Sergeant Deb, her section sergeant, who will make sure Wiggles takes her antibiotics and keep an eye on her for any further issues. Sergeant Deb finds me and First Sergeant Bob about a day later and tells me two more things about Wiggles. She's refusing to take her antibiotics and she wants to get out of the army. I again talk with Wiggles. So you want out of the army, you know you have a couple years left on your contract, right? I know, but I'm just done being a soldier and I want to be out of the army. Okay, I can make that happen. You don't want to be here, then I don't want you here either. But here's the deal, you gotta play by the rules. I can get you out with an honorable discharge, and I'll start the paperwork as soon as we're back in Hawaii. But you need to take your antibiotics, do your job, and be where you're supposed to be. You do your part, and I'll do my part for you. Sound good? Yep, I can do that. Spoiler alert, she couldn't do that. For the rest of the Thailand exercise, Sergeant Deb had to take control of Wiggles' meds and force her to take them, when she could actually find Wiggles, who consistently found someplace else to be. At one point in the next week or so, she accuses First Sergeant Bob of having adult relations with her, easily disproven as he doesn't have any STIs, and Wiggles has all of them. She was just trying to stir up trouble with wild accusations, I guess. We get back to Hawaii, and I start the process to get her out of the army, because as much as she's been a handful of trouble in Thailand, I'm thinking it's still easier at this point to kick her to the curb than it is to keep her around and punish her before kicking her out. I was wrong. Even as I started to work on her discharge, she ramps up the stupidity. Here are a few examples. Wiggles gets caught drinking, only 19 years old. Wiggles and her husband lie to the on-base housing office and provide forged authorization documents to get into rent-free on-base housing that they didn't qualify for. Side note, Mr. Wiggles was no winner either. He was about to be dishonorably discharged from his infantry unit for selling illicit substances to other soldiers. Wiggles shows up at the infirmary to get treatment for facial bruising. Mr. Wiggles kicked her in the face while wearing his combat boots when Wiggles accused him of cheating on her. Wiggles refuses to show up for work or any unit formation and can't be found anywhere for days. Wiggles slashes all four tires on Mr. Wiggles' car, then attacks him with a knife when he confronts her. Military police are called and end up taking him in when Wiggles gives a sob story but he's the one with defensive wounds on his hands, not her. One of my male sergeants uses my open door policy to visit me one day, tells me he saw Wiggles stripping at one of the skankier gentlemen's clubs down in Honolulu the night before, and she had also convinced one of our other female soldiers to come along with her to do the same. Here's a weird one. I get a call from a temp agency asking me if it's okay for Wiggles to continue working through them 
as an administrative assistant for clients in town. Not uncommon for soldiers to have a second job, but with everything else she was up to at the time, this one just had me going WTF? There's more, but you get the idea. At this point, Wiggle's actions are egregious enough that I can no longer just kick her out with an honorable discharge. I put her on notice that she's at risk for a court martial. I thought that threat might keep her in line, but she just couldn't seem to stop herself from getting stupider and stupider. It's the old 80-20 problem, 80% 80 of your time is spent dealing with 20% of your folks who are troublemakers. At this point, I'm wasting a not insignificant amount of time dealing with Wiggle's issues almost daily. I had genuinely and in good faith offered her the easy path, but I guess she figured she'd try to burn the place down on the way out since she apparently thought she was getting what she wanted no matter what she did. I was reminded of what my old platoon sergeant used to say when I was coming up through the ranks. You want to get stupid? Go ahead, but I can get stupider. Cue the revenge. She's causing me daily headaches, so I'm going to bring the pain back to her. Honorable discharge paperwork is out the window, and I lean into the special court-martial process instead. My legal counsel tells me that Wiggle's activities are likely to get her a couple weeks confinement at most, maybe not even that. She may get a monetary fine, and she'll probably get an other than honorable discharge, potential for a bad conduct discharge, which are worse, but while her actions have been not that good, they also are not that bad. I'm rational enough to understand that. I have a brief chat with Captain Morgan, Wiggle's military defense attorney, about where I'm going with this case. During our chat, I try to be a gentleman and let him know that Wiggles is going to be trouble for him if he's not careful. He gives me a condescending, this isn't my first rodeo, I'm a big boy and can take care of myself. Fair enough, I tried to warn you. Normally, a soldier getting a special court martial for piddly crap might get confined to the barracks, restricted to their on-base quarters, or something similar for the duration of the process. It's not like she killed someone, right? However, my military legal counsel drops this little gem in my ear. He tells me Wiggles has met all five of the conditions, dangers to other, flight risk, etc., required by military law, Uniform Code of Military Justice, to warrant requesting confinement prior to her trial. He tells me, if you can remember these five conditions and elaborate on the details at our next pre-trial meeting with the military magistrate, you might be able to get her confined to the Navy brig at Ford Island until the trial. I'm a guy who likes to pay attention to sound legal advice, so I do just as he says. A couple days later, we go in for the pre-trial meeting and I run down the list for the magistrate. Boom! Magistrate orders Wiggles to be confined in the brig through the trial. First Sergeant Bob and Platoon Sergeant Maggie go to pick her up from her on-base housing. She won't open the door, but they know she's inside because they can clearly hear her and Mr. Wiggles banging away. This is important for later. The Wiggles finish up. She takes her time getting showered and dressed and finally comes to the door when it pleases her. Off she goes to the brig. The pretrial processes take up the next four weeks. During that time, I have to deal with Captain Morgan, the paralegals in his office, and various fun things to do with her pending court-martial. Other than that, it's blissfully peaceful. Wiggles chills in the brig for four weeks. Seriously, chills. Every time I had to visit, it was freezing in there. I'm required to make weekly welfare visits to see if she's being mistreated, if she has any needs that aren't being met, etc. Seems weird, but as her commander, I'm still responsible to make sure the brig staff aren't mistreating my soldier. Other goings-on in this time period. Mr. Wiggles fraudulently applies for a car loan and gets a van in their names. Mr. Wiggles is dishonorably discharged and then kicked off the island, flies home to wherever the heck he originally enlisted from. Captain Morgan asks me to consider an OTH discharge and time served in lieu of taking things all the way to trial. I'm hot to get that pound of flesh from her, but my legal counsel advises me to avoid the court-martial and just kick Wiggles with the OTH discharge. After all, he says, she's already been locked up for almost three weeks, so the magistrate will probably just give her time served and the OTH anyway. See my earlier comment about sound legal advice. 
my boss, Lieutenant Colonel Ryan, thinks I'm too invested in the case, that I'm no longer objective. Lieutenant Colonel Ryan insists on coming with me to the brig for the next welfare visit. This is three weeks into Wiggle's stay in those luxurious accommodations. Among other BS lines she throws at us, Wiggles tells us she needs to see the dentist about a filling that's giving her trouble. And Motrin just isn't working. At the end of the visit, Lieutenant Colonel Ryan tells the guards about Wiggles' filling, asks if they can give her anything stronger than Motrin, then instructs them to follow up with the dentist. Guard actually laughs out loud at this and says, No sir, Motrin is the best we can do in the brig. And that other thing, for the last two weeks, she's been telling anyone with ears that she wants to try getting her wisdom teeth pulled before she's kicked out. She doesn't have a problem with any fillings. It was hilarious to watch Lieutenant Colonel Ryan's face go from obvious concern for Wiggles' well-being to outright fury. And the next words out of his mouth were, That be lied to me. I make arrangements with Captain Morgan to accept his request for time served, and OTH in lieu of court-martial. Sometime later that week, I get a call from the brig. Wiggles is pregnant. Remember the scene at her house four weeks prior? And they can't keep her confined anymore because of it. She has to be released back to her unit until the court-martial or other actions are complete. Captain Morgan stakes his reputation on Wiggles being a good girl until we can send her back home to Carolina. He'll come to regret that, and he can't say, I didn't warn him. We get Wiggles back from her four-week all-inclusive stay at the brig. I've accepted Captain Morgan's request to avoid the court-martial, and I can find Wiggles to the barracks under supervision for the nine days she has left until her flight to Carolina. Immediately, we have another crap show. Wiggles is smoking in the barracks. Not a big deal that she's smoking, it's just not allowed inside barracks rooms. Wiggles is caught with a bottle of hypnotic liquor in her barracks room. She's still only 19. Wiggles slips out of the barracks and runs off for a day when her platoon sergeant gets distracted from supervising her. First Sergeant Bob and Lieutenant Ricky, the executive officer, go to collect Wiggles' belongings from her on-base housing so we can box it up and ship it to her home. And they find that Mr. Wiggles has left behind a bunch of stuff he stole from other soldiers. Body armor, military equipment, and some ammo, smoke grenades, and explosives that he stole during trips to the range. All lined up right inside the front door where it's impossible to miss. They call me asking what to do. Just collect it all, return the equipment to the central issue facility, and dump the ammo and explosives in the nearest amnesty box. Mr. Wiggles obviously meant for Wiggles to take the fall for having it, husband of the year. If we take that bait, Wiggles will be here forever. I don't want that, do you? Nope, I don't want that either. It'll be like it never happened. In light of all this drama, I bring Wiggles into my office to remind her of her agreement to be a good girl till she leaves the island, with Lieutenant Ricky as a witness in the office to protect my butt. Wiggles, you're in violation of your release agreement from the brig. You've been sneaking out of the barracks, you've been smoking and drinking. She cuts me off. Yeah, and doing all kinds of illicit substances too. Heavy sarcasm voice. Be that as it may, I'm giving you fair warning that you're at risk of losing the deal I made with Captain Morgan. Additionally, you're pregnant again. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but most damage to a fetus from alcohol and smoking will come in the first few weeks after conception. I don't know if you're planning to keep this one or not, but at the rate you're going, this baby's going to be born dumber than you. Wiggles' mouth gaping like a darn fish, finally picks her jaw up off the floor. Wiggles then bolts from my office and runs down to Lieutenant Colonel Ryan's office at the other end of the building to squeal on me for insulting her, Lieutenant Ricky hot on her heels. She tries to rush into Lieutenant Colonel Ryan's office, but Lieutenant Ricky gets in first and fills him in. Lieutenant Ricky tells me later how it went down. Wiggles is yelling about how I called her stupid, Strangely vanilla thing to focus on, considering everything she's done, but you do you, and that she's being mistreated. Lieutenant Colonel Ryan yells at his admin to get Captain Morgan on the phone now. He reams Captain Morgan for his client's Jack Buttery, tells him to effing fix this, and makes various threats to Captain Morgan's career. About half an hour later, I get a call from Captain Morgan. OP, OP, OP. 
Yes, he did that whole patronizing BS. I can't believe the words I'm hearing from Wiggles. I'm shocked, just shocked, that you would use language like that and call her names. Side note, my mom is an attorney, and I grew up with tales from the courthouse about lawyers using exactly this sort of hyperbole. Your Honor, I'm shocked, appalled, and dismayed that opposing counsel would attempt to paint my client in such a light. It's the kind of BS they said when they didn't have a good argument. So as soon as I hear the word shocked, I know I own him and immediately cut in. And I bet you're appalled and dismayed too. Captain Morgan stumbled and sounded slightly confused. Well, yes, of course I am. You can't talk to soldiers like that. I know of a lieutenant colonel, a commander, who called one of her soldiers stupid and she's no longer in command now. I didn't call her stupid, I informed her of basic biological facts. Not my problem if she takes the news poorly, and arguably, she's not all that smart. Anyway, you called me, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't to warn me about what I said to Wiggles, so what do you want? What will it take to prevent you from kicking back our deal? Apparently, Lieutenant Colonel Ryan had cinched his butthole up good and tight. You could get her on a plane tomorrow, how about if I get her out of here by Friday? It was Wednesday, and she was due to fly out the following Wednesday. I don't think you can manage that, but good on you if you do. To his credit, Captain Morgan gets Wiggles a flight for Sunday, three days early. I print up official orders appointing Lieutenant Ricky as a military escort specifically for her. Lieutenant Ricky drives her to the airport, and the airline desk agent calls me to verify his status when they get to the check-in counter. They give him a special pass to get through security with her. He stays with her at the gate to make sure she gets on and stays on the plane, then stays at the gate until the plane is in the air. Some boogers are hard to flick. We wanted to make darn sure this one landed someplace else. About a month later, I get a call from the military police about a derelict van in the parking lot with all four tires slashed. Guess who that belonged to? It's really kind of sad when I look back on it. I had two other soldiers come to me at different points asking to get out of the army ahead of their contracts. One just didn't want to be in the army anymore. The other did want to stay in the army, but had family issues that would be a lot easier to deal with as a civilian. They played by the rules, and I got both of them out with honorable discharges and all the benefits. They even qualified for unemployment. Too easy. Wiggles could have had the same treatment. I told her exactly what I could do for her, then had to shift gears and told her exactly what I was going to do to her. Then I did it. I could have been her best friend on her way out the door, but instead I ended up owning her and her dumb butt defense attorney. She screwed herself out of transition benefits and access to the VA and picked up a lifelong black mark for employment, all because she couldn't play nice for a few weeks. She decided she wanted to play F around F around games, and we all know what happens next. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Miriafa. It says, I thought I knew what came next, and I thought it was jail. But the person in your story got a lot more slack and leniency from everyone involved than I thought possible. Now, OP replied to this comment, they said, I like to say, I'll give you all the rope you need to scale the cliff. If you choose to use it to hang yourself, that's your problem, not mine. This right here is completely true. Some people just can't help themselves. Even when you're holding their hand all the way through, they just want to see everything burn. And that seems to be the case in this story. One can hope that by being given the gift of not being locked up, that the person in the story will be able to get the help they need to get their lives back on track. But with their track record, I wouldn't hold my breath. Our next story today comes to us from Of Pearls and Swine, Topsy Turvy. Let's jump right in. I started dating a girl about seven years ago. When we met, she was getting up on her feet and trying to find her way in life. I let my imagination take over and started envisioning her potential and what kind of life we could have together. I had never had the feeling of disarmed, punch-drunk love that I had for her, and that probably clouded my judgment. Throughout our time together, she would reach out and ask for money for things, repairing a car, paying a bill, etc. We were getting closer the longer we dated, 
and I would always help her, assuming that I was making an investment in both of our lives by helping her through a period of instability. In all, I probably gave her about $15,000. After about four years of this, I finally popped the question. She accepted, and we were married after a brief engagement. About six months into our marriage, she told me she had been having car trouble and needed about $2,000 for the repair. This struck me as a bit odd. By that time, I was more familiar with her vehicle and knew her explanation for what the issue was didn't make sense. One evening after she went to sleep, I went and had a look at the part of the car she had said was faulty. No issue. This set off alarms. I grabbed her phone and, on a hunch, typed in the amount she had asked for and it returned a text message with a guy she had previously dated. Apparently, he had reached out and asked for help repairing his car, and lo and behold, he had asked for the same amount she had requested from me. My stomach turned as the thought entered my mind that maybe I had subsidized other of this guy's expenses across the time I had dated my wife. As I read through the messages further, I realized that this guy was Lester Diamond to my Sam Rothstein, and I had been played like a fool. Look up that reference if you're not familiar. I had spent my entire relationship as a proxy sugar daddy. I thought on this for a few weeks and tried to figure out what to do next. These sacrifices were not insignificant to me. I had been working as a surgical resident for much of our courtship, making very little money and working long hours to form a strong, solid foundation for our future. This was devastating, and I realized that I couldn't reconcile the situation. Once I had cooled down, I waited for an evening, my wife went to bed early, and I got into her phone. I caught up on the most recent messages she and her paramour had sent one another. Then I initiated a conversation with him. I posed as her and told him she had been drinking, she is a recovering alcoholic, and that she needed to get some things off her chest. I didn't go overboard, but I did send messages to the effect that she was not over him and that her affections had grown since marrying me. I all but teed him up to move in for a relationship with her. I then abruptly ended the chat and asked that we not talk about the conversation again in order to avoid furthering her relapse, but that we both keep in mind what we had spoken about and see if we could make a life together work. I then deleted the text from her phone and hoped the two would proceed forward together. They did. I kept an eye on the text for the next few months and progressively saw things heat up between them until it looked like she was committed to leaving me. We didn't have many assets together at the time, as I was still finishing a surgical residency, so I knew the divorce would be quick and painless and that we would go our separate ways and she would start a new life with the guy whose underachievements I had been funding. So I filed for divorce and had her served papers. I was generous with the $10,000 in assets between us in order to make the split as quick as possible and went on with our ways to begin life anew. And you'd think that is the end of the story, right? Oh no, friend. You see, mama didn't raise a cuck. In our state, not only are assets separated upon marital severance, but so are debts. And medical school is effing expensive. Really expensive a quarter of a million dollars expensive. So, the B ended up with parting gift of about $125,000 of my student loans. And guess who she shotgun married two months after our divorce? <laughs> Fortunately for her, she'll only have to pay half of that amount, because if history does indeed repeat itself, he'll be paying the other half once their marriage ends as well. It was all I could do to not send them a piggy bank as a wedding gift. Best $15,000 I ever spent. I honestly wasn't aware that debts that somebody has before they go into a marriage would be split up if that marriage dissolves. In fact, that doesn't sound right to me. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Althar6. It says, While I think you're right about debts like credit card debt or anything owned jointly, I'm 99.999% sure that student loans taken out in just your name are your responsibility. They're one of those sticky can't get out of no matter what debts, like even bankruptcy doesn't impact student loans, 
I think in this case, even if somehow OP's ex ended up with half of his debts, if they decided not to pay them, OP would still be on the line for all of that money. I just can't see somebody lending money to somebody and then all of a sudden they have to go and collect it from somebody else. That just doesn't sit well with me. Our next story today comes to us from Captain Bow Bow. Park your car in a danger zone? Good luck to find it back. Let's jump right in. OP added at the top of this story, compulsory, not US, not English speaker, not my story, 90s, and edited for typos. I'll write with that out of the way, here we go. This is the story of Mike. Mike managed the warehouse of a hospital. Said hospital was built in the 50s in the center of town. The stadium is on one side, the justice hall on another, and schools on a third side. There's also a casern and two other medical buildings around, so the streets are crowded with cars searching for parking. One day, when opening the gate of the landing dock, Mike noticed a little car parked in the hospital internal court, near the 2,000 liter liquid oxygen tank. Of course, it is absolutely forbidden because, one, this is private property, and two, the court has been planned before 35 ton trucks were the norm, and maneuvering is already difficult. And number three, liquid oxygen is explosive. A car or truck hitting the tank would be a major hazard. It was a small Italian car, no advertisement, but it was the kind commonly used as a second car or to travel in the Dolomite Mountains where the roads are very narrow. So Mike makes some calls. The car is not owned by someone of the warehouse or the nursing staff. No doctors have such a small car. The reception made public announcements asking visitors to move the badly parked car to no avail. By 1800 hours, the car is gone. Okay, problem solved. The day after, the car is there yet. Same calls with the same result. Mike called the police, but the police cannot make it towed because it's a private place. And towing company won't do it without a police query. By chance, that day only lorries came to unload medical materials. When it is time to close the warehouse, the car is gone once more. On the third day when the landing dock opened, the car is already there. And now that is a real problem. The 35-ton truck from Germany must come this day. There's no way it can reach the dock without tilting the car and the liquid oxygen tank. It has become a clear and present problem of security. All the warehouse team exchanged ideas on what to do, but all feasible solutions have already been tried. It is when someone from maintenance team passed on a forklift with a pallet of plaster bags. It struck everybody at the same time. There is no way the Italian car could weigh more than one ton of plaster. So Mike goes to see the forklift driver while the team searches for a wooden pallet. Slowly, with many precautions, the forklift slid the pallet under the car lift the whole thing, and went and dropped the car off on the nearby street. In the first 10 minutes, the police are warned that a car is parked in the middle of the street blocking traffic. The said car is towed away in less than half hour. The truck had no problem maneuvering. Two days later, rumors ran the hospital. It was the car of the director's wife. She worked in a medical building some streets away. While everybody found that Mike made a good move, they wait to see what will follow. It is now a global problem of management. Mike is called to the directors. As soon as he passes the door, he starts to explain, yes, I know it is your wife's car, but the director went, what? No, I called you for an entirely other matter. I warned my wife several times. She had it coming, that C. Until the hospital closed 20 years after, the story has been repeated to each new worker and each medical student. Put your car under a tree if you want, but don't park in the landing dock court, because Mike will make it disappear. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Black Avenger. It says, I agree that this didn't turn into a pro-revenge story, but it should have. The person who parked their car in a dangerous spot not only should have lost their car, but their license to drive and their job as well. This puts people's lives on the line. It says so in the beginning of the story. I am just as angry with the police of the story and the towing companies as well. I think the one thing that I really like about this story is that they put the car right out in the middle of the public road. 
and the police, who didn't want to deal with it previously because it was on public property, well, now it was their problem and they had to come out and have the car towed. That worked out beautifully. Our next story today comes to us from Almost Fungible, Terrible Boss Gets His Comeuppance. Let's jump right in. Setting High Volume Independent Tire Shop in Northern New England, circa 2012. We'll call it 123 Tire. Target Evil General Manager. We'll call him Jay. Aggravated parties, basically everybody that worked there at the time, but mainly myself and the receptionist. We'll call her Ruth. Backstory. So Jay had been the GM of 123 Tire since he got the previous GM fired in 2004. He was and is a complete narcissist who believed he could do no wrong, and if you didn't agree with him, God help you. Over the years, Jay had done a number of illegal things. For example, he was always very physical with his employees. One time, he was wrestling with another salesman. This was commonplace and unavoidable if you valued your job. And the salesman, we'll call him Paul, took a bad fall and broke his knee. In order to avoid the ire of the owner, we'll call him Lou, Jay immediately clocked Paul out and told him to go to the hospital. He also told Paul to use his own insurance and that the company would pay the deductible in order to avoid a messy workers' comp claim. Paul did as he was told and kept his job, but his knee was never the same, and he ended up addicted to opioids thanks to Jay's actions. Jay also had an affinity for the ladies. Now, I must mention here that Jay is an ultra-conservative Christian father of 11 children, who believes that a woman's place is uneducated, barefoot, pregnant, and in the kitchen. That being said, several female receptionists came and went over the years, with only Ruth sticking around because she needed the money and begrudgingly accepted the regular harassment. When he wasn't behaving inappropriately with every lady that walked in the door, he was behaving inappropriately with every other employee. Want to leave early on a slow day? Wrestle the biggest guy in the shop for it. Jay was big on wrestling. Big guy isn't in that day? Buy him a pizza. Trying to have lunch? Expect Jay to throw food at you. Want to schedule a vacation? Tough. He'll let you know the week before if you can take it. He was a complete child, and I put up with him for six long years because I couldn't let him win. The setting. It was the summer of 2012, and Ruth and I had had enough. Jay was completely out of control as usual, now telling me, a Latino, that if Obama won re-election, that he would make my work life hell come November. Ruth was going through a divorce, and he was trying to move in on her. For the record, Ruth hated Jay's guts. It was time to hit him where it hurt. Ruth was ready to drop a lawsuit for harassment on Jay and 123 Tire, and I was ready to drop one for constructive discharge. Now, suing an employer doesn't exactly look good on one CV, but we were both at wit's end. The Revenge Ruth and I decided one evening that Jay's ultra-conservative values must be shared by his wife and family. As he was always working, his wife must be the one who goes to the mailbox every day. I created a throwaway email and got him a Bill Me Later subscription to Hustler Magazine and Playboy and Penthouse. Fast forward a couple of weeks and he comes in looking like death warmed over. Turns out Mrs. J didn't appreciate his new taste in reading material and he's now living in a motel in the next town over. Now, he's not saying that his wife kicked him out, he's far too much of a narcissist for that, but I could put two and two together. He's decided that he's done with his wife and 11 children, and that he is going to start a new life with Ruth. After all, her divorce is going to be finalized at the end of the week. It was at this point that Lou's sister, co-owner of 123 Tire, and not a big fan of Jay, we'll call her Liz, overheard him talking to Ruth in a less than business appropriate manner. Liz later took Ruth aside and got the straight poop on what had been happening for the last several years, and that was that. The next morning, Lou called Jay to his office and was far kinder than I would have been. Jay was to lose his title of GM, and go to work in another 123 tire location an hour away until the end of the year. Beginning in 2013, 
Jay would need to find other employment. Jay was also not to contact the location that he had overseen and worked in for years. Also, the location that Jay was relocated to added an hour to his already hour-long commute. I suspect that Lou also encouraged Jay to reconcile with his wife, which Jay did. Epilogue Jay ended his employment with 123 Tire in January of 2013 and never suspected any involvement from me. In fact, to this day, he stays in occasional contact with me. He went on to work for another tire store, this one a corporate chain as a store manager, put his house on the market, bought a new one closer to his new employer and everything. A year later, he was fired after bringing a seven-figure lawsuit on them. They settled out of court and he moved back to the house he was in before as it hadn't sold. Jay's next job was five minutes from his home and his new boss was the guy that Jay had gotten fired back in 2004. That one lasted a couple of years until Jay gave up on finding employment in the area and moved himself and the whole family to the Midwest sometime around 2016. Now, in the Midwest, Jay has been unable to keep a job in the car business for more than a year, and as soon as each of his kids turns 18, they seem to move right back to the area they grew up in. His New England home sold in 2019 for less than he bought it for. Ruth still works for 123 Tire and is very happy there now. The icing on the cake. In early 2021, I finally left my job at 123 Tire, sold my house, and became a full-time RVer. I've seen 47 US states, including the Midwestern state and town that Jade now resides in. I looked him up when I got there and he came to see me after he got out of work in my new RV. He said, boy, you must really think something of me to look me up and want to see me all the way out here. If he only knew the half of it. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called kplatinum777. It quotes OP where they said, he decided that he's done with his wife and 11 children and that he is going to start a new life with Ruth. After all, her divorce is going to be finalized at the end of the week. Kplatinum777 says, well, gee, that might have been a good plan if he'd only consulted Ruth. I'm always amazed at the number of people who take drastic and often irreversible steps to be in a relationship with someone they don't know very well, who they've never brought those concerns up with, and who often wouldn't be interested if they did. OP responded to this comment. It says, it does truly boggle the mind. As a bit of further backstory, Jay had been telling Ruth for a while that she needed to get out of the relationship she was in. It was actually the only good piece of advice he ever gave her, as it served a twofold benefit to her. One, her ex-husband was actually a pretty bad dude. Two, Jay took Ruth's divorce as the signal he needed to make more advances on her. The fact that Jay's wife gave him the boot at the same time was just even more incentive. Ruth knew what would happen probably even more than I did. Kplatinum777 responded to this comment with, that's somebody who facilitated a good result despite having every intention of doing a bad thing. It sounds like Jeff didn't want to help Ruth, he wanted her for himself. He was capitalizing on her then-husband's abuse so that he could swoop in. And, given the way he conducted himself, there's no evidence that he'd have been any better for her. I can't help but sit back and think that there would have been two very lucrative lawsuits on the hands of OP and Ruth against 123 Tire. They could have taken them to the cleaners. I hope the company gave them a nice bonus for saving them from two very expensive lawsuits. Our next story today comes to us from Astacask. I was able to simultaneously gain a 30,000 per year pension for my mother while wiping my piece of crap father's retirement. Let's jump right in. My father is the Canadian Satan. Growing up with him was less than fun and I can assure you, based on witnessing it, he was a less than fun husband. I'd go on about what a piece of crap my father is, but instead I'll quote a judge. You're the most despicable human I've ever had in my courtroom. And that's coming from a family court judge. I read this winning endorsement of my dad's personality in the court documents I acquired related to his divorce with my mom. The same place I discovered the effery he had engaged in to steal from my mom. 
It's also where I found the information I needed to get one over on him so severely he's going to disinherit me. A frame of reference about my father is that he's a pathological narcissist and behaves exactly how those people are compelled to act. They aren't generous people, and punching them in the wallet is like a slap shot to the taint from Gretzky. He's kind of like Donkey from Shrek, but also Joseph Stalin, a monstrous jackbutt. Chapter 1 Those that sow the wind shall reap a whirlwind. Our actions always have consequences, and my padre has plenty to answer for. My attempts to hold him to account didn't jump to immediate jihad. They started with diplomacy and a therapist. About 10 months ago when our tale begins, I was going through some stuff. Stuff being a whole lot of PTSD related to both my dad's abuse and my job as a paramedic. He did a ton that affected me deeply. Things that I needed to move past, along with all that other razzmatazz from 15 years of EMS. In so trying to move past and work through everything, I quit drinking. Started turning my untreated PTSD into treated PTSD and thinking having my dad involved might help me and our relationship. Well, I seriously effing misjudged that one, so you'll probably be unsurprised to hear that conversation went swimmingly. I'll spare you the lurid detail, but when I broached the subject with him, our back and forth degenerated into visceral hate, with him screaming at me that I'm a failed paramedic, liar, and a piece of crap alcoholic. While I have a certain pride about my job, I have more pride in my 14 month sobriety, so hearing this from my old man might have caused me to behave a bit psychotically. I got right pissed off at him and decided to dig up every bit of dirt I could, see what kind of man he actually is and has been. When it was convenient, I hopped in the mystery machine before taking a trip to the courthouse to unleash my inner gumshoe. Everything is public record, so I bulk bought copies before retiring to my easy chair to read, plot, and pet my white long-haired cat. For good measure, I obtained a file of divorce document from my mother. Soon enough, I hit upon a line of inquiry worth following up on. It seems that during the final settlement of my parents' divorce, 2002, my mother was awarded one-third of my father's employment pension. She was a stay-at-home mother and could not earn one herself, so it was given to her by a judge. Mighty effing strange, because my father, as he brags, took a nearly full pension and retired a bit early. No way that butt hat was living the last 10 years after retiring early on two-thirds pension. He isn't constantly bitching about it. So I asked my mother if she was collecting a pension from his job or had cashed out the value. 100k plus at the time, 20 years ago. No to both questions. Well, that's interesting. I wonder if that's collectible on and what 20 years of compound interest from a pension fund makes it worth. Well, I did eventually find out, along with the fact that my dear old dad had been collecting my mother's portion for 10 years, in hilariously open violation of a legal order from a judge. Why didn't my mother pursue this sooner? A combination of being unable to afford a lawyer, being his victim for 20 years, and pessimism after so much of his continued dodging obligation to the order, she just quit. There is effectively no statute of limitations he could hide behind because of the wording of the settlement. Insofar as I could tell, I had him dead to rights, and my mother would be collecting. It would be a slam dunk. I just needed to hire a lawyer to help me. So I set out to find the most unbalanced, bloodthirsty psychotic who passed the bar exam. Chapter 2. A2 Pension Lady As it says in the good book, screw unto others as they would screw unto you. So that's what I set out to do. The misanthropic sociopath I hired for legal counsel suggested we send a demand letter to the pension office to try and remedy it before filing what would undoubtedly be an easy win for him. I agreed in spirit and instead phoned up the pension office and got put through to the woman managing my father's file. Well, she was a delight and it was a trivial matter for me to get her to loathe my dad. We talked for 45 minutes and I swear if you'd given me another hour, I could have convinced her to bomb his house. In all our conversations about life, families and relationships, we got down to some things of note. Since I could show her correspondence her office had sent to my father, CC'd my mom on some years ago, 
and ongoing for five consecutive years, trying to resolve this matter, which he had ignored, she was more than willing to start the process on remedy immediately. Full cooperation from this lady and her office was a matter of merely providing documentation, and with my lawyer on retainer, this office was beyond asking my father to comply. They complied for him. About two months since I last spoke to my father, and he now had no idea his pension was about to take a serious hit. Below, I'm going to break down how big a turd I put in his bowl of ice cream. My mother's portion was made whole and adjusted to reflect that her portion was brought to maturity and beyond, so his early retirement doesn't affect her fund. So he loses 10 years of valuation to her. He also retired 3 years early, which knocks him down now to 17 years of pension valuation, not 27. If you'd forgotten, my dad had been collecting my mom's money and was overpaid by 30000 per year for the last 10 years. Like I said, mom was made whole, so the pension company is going to claw back that overpayment from the base valuation of his current pension fund. I'm not exactly sure what that does to the number, but it effectively nerfs my old man's private retirement fund. He's got government old age pension that he took early too, whoops. My dad did some awful crap to me, but I only had to suffer 17 years of him. My mom still has the high score at 20. As much as I did this for spite and malicious glee, I did do it to give my mom a chance at proper retirement. Chapter 3 Glitter Bombs of Justice My mother started collecting her pension about three months after I contacted the pension office, and to celebrate, she bought tickets to New Zealand for the family for Christmas, so we can see our relatives. I was able to get most of my retainer from the lawyer back, and to celebrate, I went online to order a glitter bomb. I was able to ship it to my old man anonymously from another country. God bless the USA. I heard through my sister he opened it up in his stupid red Miata. <laughs> He'll never get rid of it. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Vigorous Pigeon. It says, beautifully planned, executed, and with a cherry on top. Congrats on your sobriety and your healing. You are not a failure. You are my hero of the day. Most of all, congrats, and I tip my imaginary hat to you for looking after your mom. OP used one of the most Canadian statements I think I've ever heard in a pro-revenge story. They aren't generous people, and punching them in the wallet is like a slap shot to the taint from Gretzky. It doesn't get much more Canadian than that. This next story comes to us from Ancient Ice. Make my coworkers cry, I will help karma turn your life upside down. Let's jump right in. Backstory. I worked at this hotel for over two years and was one of two people left that went through the training when our hotel changed hotel franchises. During this training, we were told about certain rules the company had. Cast, manager, front desk manager, he was only here for four to six months at this point. Me, I am a nice guy, unless you are a bully or an entitled person. A few others I will mention as we go through. Story, one afternoon, I was scheduled to work second shift, three to 11. I walked in and both AM front desk coworkers looked like they had been massively crying as their makeup was smeared. My manager looking quite pissed, I asked, what's wrong? We have a major jerk as a guest. This guy is the highest level on the rewards for the hotel chain. He is very demanding and wants free upgrades, free this or that, and screams anytime he has an interaction with the staff. This guy has made every department call me complaining about him. Now, this guy just came to the desk and screamed at these two co-workers until they were both crying. These two ladies were fresh high school graduates and were very sweet and innocent people. They loved helping people and didn't deserve this treatment. As he is explaining this, I look up this guy's room details. Once my manager finishes explaining everything this guy has done, I see the guy's info and I had a smile from ear to ear. I reply, didn't you see? He's an employee of a different hotel. Yes, but so what? I replied, first off, while you travel as an employee, you're required to behave and be respectful. It is in the fine print on the discount form. I grabbed his form and showed it to the manager. Failure to be respectful can lead to having your employee discount suspended or permanently revoked and could even get you terminated. You need to call this guy's hotel and ask for the GM. 
then explain to him who you are and what this guy is doing. I look up the hotel phone number and call the hotel and then handed my manager the phone. Manager after his call ends with the GM, he has an evil and satisfying smile on his face. His GM is steaming mad after I described all the stuff this guy has done. Main switchboard phone rings. I answered. Hello, thank you for calling hotel name. How may I direct your call? I want to speak to entitled jerk's room, please. I replied. Absolutely, sir. Have a nice day. Transferred the call and looked at my manager and saying with a sarcastic tone, someone wanted to talk to entitled jerk. Gee, I wonder who that could be. Manager continues after he stopped laughing. The GM gave me his personal cell phone number and said if I have any more issues to call him immediately. I am leaving the phone number next to the switchboard. If you need it, call him. I told manager, your revenge is done. Now for my revenge. Manager was wide-eyed. Oh crap, what are you going to do? Me smiling a very evil smile. You'll see. I picked up the phone to make a call. Hello, hotel rewards customer service? Yes, I would like to report someone using rewards account while using employee discount on his stay. He can't do that. I replied, I know, I'm calling to report him. I gave her the guest reservation number and rewards member number. I continued, I bet anything if you dig through this guy's history, you will find all his stays are probably at employee discount. I'm starting a ticket to have this guy's account investigated. I replied, thank you, then hung up the phone. The manager watched as I then removed his rewards number from his stay. My manager had a huge grin on his face. That was awesome. I explained, oh, I'm not quite finished with him yet. It is time to go spread the news to all departments. He is no longer a rewards member. I made a new key for his room without concierge access. I walked around to every department. As I explained why I was stopping by, everyone had the same reaction as soon as I mentioned the guy's name. Oh God, what now about this butthole? I finished explaining how he was no longer a reward member. And if he gives anyone issues to call the front desk immediately and his GM, already probably tore him a new one just a minute ago. Everyone was so happy at this news. I finally went to the concierge room, used the guest's new key to void his current key. Then I walked into the room and explained the information to the evening concierge. She cringed at the mention of his name after explaining she would not have to deal with him again and asked her to leave the morning person a note about this guy not allowed in the concierge room anymore. She was very happy. While I was gone, evidently the manager explained what we did to the 2 a.m. front desk ladies. The minute I got back to the desk, both my front desk co-workers all came up to me and gave me a huge hug and thanked me so many times. Manager to me after the other co-workers went home, do me a huge favor please. I replied, sure, what's up? If I ever piss you off, please come tell me so I can fix the issue. Later that night, entitled jerk comes to the desk hat in hand politely saying his key doesn't work. I replied, oh, so sorry about that. Let me make you a new key in the best fake smile I can muster. Aftermath. Next day, I check his rewards account and it is now suspended. Check back next week. Sorry, account number not found. Jumping down to the comments in this one, there's one from a user called Undersea Serenity. It says, it's amazing that someone working in hospitality, let alone another hotel, could treat staff with such disdain. Usually, the crap you deal with in any service industry leads to treating others in the same field with more compassion, or at least understanding. There's definitely a couple of ways you can look at this though. There are people out there who go, well, I know what it's like, and I won't do that to other people. And then other people say, well, I had to take it, so now it's my turn to dish it out. Those people are giant dicks. This next story comes to us from Rusty Sachs. No show to a corporate meeting? We'll see about that. Let's jump right in. I'm not sure if this belongs here at Pro Revenge or in a different Reddit sub. Please let me know if it does, but here it is anyway. The cast. Note that none of these names are real. They are all pseudonyms to meet guidelines. Brooke, my sister, Angie, the accounting girl, Mark, milk toast boss, Victor, vice president of operations. This story is about my sister's first job after graduating from college with a bachelor's degree in business management back in the middle 70s. She was hired by that recording tape company whose advertising tagline was, 
is it real or is it? Anyway, her job was the travel coordinator for both the sales and tech support teams out in the field to come to the corporate offices periodically for various types of meetings or training, depending on the field employee specialty. Brooke's responsibilities included booking airline flights, hotels, rental cars, approving per diems, and other travel-related upfront arrangements. It didn't take her long to figure out that there were a lot of no-shows, particularly from the sales staff, who always seemed to have some valid excuse not to make it to the meeting, and often with last-minute cancellations. You know, the, I've just booked this golf game with my most important client this week, so can you reschedule me, type of reasons. Seeing how these cancellations were costing the company big bucks, Brooke hatched a plan that created class rosters for each class, and would, just like a teacher, make notes as to who showed up and who didn't. After the class was over, she would calculate how much those who didn't show up had cost the company in terms of cancellation fees, missed flights, etc., and present them to Mark. His reaction, typical of a middle manager protecting his little fiefdom, would take her report, tell her, I'll look into it, throw it into his inbox, and then promptly forget about it. My sister has a tremendous amount of patience, unless you're being stupid, which in this case, Mark was, as far as she was concerned. Fast forward a couple of months, the reports are still stacked on top of each other in Mark's inbox, and Brooke's getting real frustrated, because these field guys are abusing the time and effort she's putting in, while attempting to get them in for their required classes. So, one day, Brooke's having lunch in the company cafeteria, along with a gal from corporate accounting. They get to talking, and Angie mentions that she's noticed the travel department's expenses are really high, percentage-wise, compared to others, and asks if Brooke has any idea why. Well, that was all it took. My sister unloaded her frustration with all the cancellations with no repercussions, thus sending the travel department's budget off the charts. Not to mention the fact she wasn't getting any support from Mark towards reducing the numbers. Brooke tells Angie she's got an idea to put an end to the waste, but she wants to get approval from somebody higher up the food chain in order to implement her idea, because she doubts Mark's ability to comprehend, let alone implement. Angie tells Brooke that she thinks she knows exactly who Brooke needs to talk to, and within a couple of days, Brooke and Angie are sitting in a plush corner office talking to the Vice President of Operations, Victor, explaining the situation. It only took Victor a couple of minutes to make a decision after Brooke described what was going on, plus her idea on how to correct it. And he told Angie that Brooke's idea was brilliant, and that the policy change would become effective on the first of the month, ten days later, which he followed up with a memorandum sent to all employees shortly after their meeting was over. Paydays were the 5th and the 20th. Those in the field who had expense accounts had to complete and turn them into accounting by the 5th to be processed and paid along with regular wages, bonus, and commissions on the 20th. Brooke's policy change idea, with the victor's blessing, was to charge back against the offender's expense account the costs associated with getting him to his corporate meeting when he didn't show up. Airline fares, hotel room, rental cars, etc. Sis told me that the first month the policy went into effect, the howls of protest could be heard all over Silicon Valley, as several ended up with minuscule paychecks after the chargebacks. But the policy had exactly the results Brooke wanted. Within three months, everyone showed up to their meetings on time as scheduled, and virtually without any more no-shows. Epilogue. Some adjustments were made to the policy during Sis's tenure. One of them being that if you knew in advance that you couldn't make a scheduled meeting, as long as it was a minimum of two weeks' notice, she could then reschedule without penalties. Other situations, such as medical emergencies, were judged on a case-by-case -case basis, but required documentation to prevent the chargeback. Sis only worked at this company about 18 months before a head-turner stole her away to be the plant manager's administrative assistant, when the microchip manufacturer that's in practically everybody's personal computer decided to build a new facility outside of Silicon Valley. She told her new boss she wasn't moving unless he could find her husband a job within the company, and he did. So they did, and they've been in that area ever since. 
My sister has a great career and I'm very proud of her. Going back to the beginning of this story, just going to correct what OP said a little bit because I believe the line was, is it live or is it Memorex? Which was a commercial from way back in the day that some of my viewers might remember. Now, a line we had from our previous story about taking a slap shot to the taint from Gretzky when you hit them in the wallet, well, that really pertains to this story as well, because sometimes hitting them where it hurts, the wallet, is the only way to gain compliance. There was a pretty heated discussion in the comments for this one about whether this really belongs in Pro Revenge. Now, I believe it does, but I'd like to hear from you guys, so comment down below. Our next story today comes to us from Techno Grind, but I didn't retire. Let's jump right in. My friend, I'll call her Sandy, worked at a travel agency in British Columbia, Canada. It was a small owner-operated business with the owner and three employees, including my friend. Everyone worked Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. One of my friend's co-workers, I'll call her Jane, an older woman in her early to mid-60s, was a long-time nuisance employee. Among other sketchy behavior, Jane was always scamming ways to take time off over and above her official paid vacation time. In order to make up for the lost hours, she would claim overtime hours in pay by supposedly going into the office in her off hours to finish up work without being requested by the owner to do so. Despite being caught in her own lies on a number of occasions and being warned about trying to claim for unsanctioned overtime, the owner of the travel agency was reluctant to officially reprimand Jane or get rid of her. The reason being is the owner discovered after she had hired Jane that Jane had actually been fired from her previous job at another local travel agency for pulling the same stunts. However, Jane had sued her former employer for unfair dismissal and had won a settlement. After a few years of my friend Sandy working at the travel agency, the owner was ready to retire and offered to sell the business to my friend. Sandy took her up on the deal and took over the business while keeping on Jane and the other employee. Once again, just as the previous owner was afraid to get rid of Jane, so was Sandy for fear of being sued. When Sandy took over the business, she instituted guidelines regarding taking time off and she established an official no overtime policy. Jane would still try with her shenanigans, but was far less successful in getting what she wanted with my friend in charge. However, Jane still had one trick up her sleeve when she wanted to take time off on a whim. Sandy was a divorced single mom of two boys who were heavily involved in youth hockey. She would sometimes leave the office an hour or two before closing to get her boys to hockey practice or a game. In order to avoid requesting in person and potentially being denied, Jane would wait for Sandy to be out of the office to book a day off if she didn't feel like coming into work or had made plans. Sandy would then arrive at work the next morning only to discover that Jane wasn't coming in. Despite this happening a number of times, Sandy would usually let it slide since there was now a definite no overtime policy. Therefore, Jane could no longer claim to come in to work on the weekend or after hours in order to try and make up for the day off. She would either miss out on a day's pay, in turn saving Sandy money as the owner, or it would come out of her remaining paid vacation days. Moreover, two people in the office at one time could usually handle everything. Jane not coming in was really a no-loss situation for Sandy. There was one time, however, when Sandy was going to be away for one or two workdays just before the weekend to take her boys to a hockey tournament. She told both Jane and the other employee, both verbally and in writing, that they could not book time off for the dates in question since she would be away and needed both of them in the office. Within a few days of giving this notice, Sandy went into the office on a Saturday to do some paperwork and go through the sales for the week. This is when she discovered that, only the day before, Jane had booked a trip for her daughter and son-in-law to Las Vegas, as well as a plane ticket in her name to Calgary, where her daughter lived. Both the trip to Vegas and the ticket to Calgary coincided with the date Sandy would be out of the office. Sandy then checked the vacation booking schedule to further discover that Jane had indeed booked the days off that she had expressly been told she couldn't have. Not mentioning she had discovered the travel Jane had booked for herself and her daughter, Sandy emailed Jane telling her she would have to deny her the days off since she had already been told they were unavailable because she, Sandy, would be away and needed Jane in the office. 
Through a continued series of email exchanges, Jane replied and outright lied to Sandy with some excuse about her daughter getting some long-awaited medical treatment or surgery, and she needed to go to Calgary to help out for a few days and look after her granddaughter. Sandy replied to this lie by telling Jane she knew about the trip she had booked to Vegas for her daughter and son-in-law. That Jane's trip to Calgary was most likely to babysit her granddaughter while her daughter was in Vegas, and that she would still have to deny Jane the days off, especially since she booked them after being told they were unavailable. Jane countered in her subsequent reply without even addressing the fact that she had been caught in a lie that she had been a dedicated employee of the travel agency for several years and couldn't understand why she was being treated so unfairly after all she had done for the business. She then wrote that since she wasn't being treated as a valued employee, she had no choice but to retire and was giving her two weeks notice. Despite Jane's threat, Sandy replied that she would still be unable to grant her the days off and left it at that without making any mention of Jane's threat to quit or retire. Sandy then contacted her accountant, who also acted as her de facto business advisor, and explained what had happened with Jane. Also aware of Jane's previous shenanigans, Sandy's accountant told her that this was the out she had been looking for with Jane, and she had it all in writing. He told her that Jane had essentially resigned and retired and all Sandy needed to do was honor Jane's desire to do so, let her finish out her two weeks or pay her two weeks wages in lieu with no further severance pay legally required since she hadn't been fired. The following Monday, Sandy went into the office early accompanied by her long-term boyfriend to act as a witness. She put Jane's belongings from her desk into a box and took the things that were property of the business. Since Jane was old school and had resisted inputting client information in the computer database, this also included a small filled box with index cards which had client phone numbers, addresses, credit card information, and other personal information noted on them. In the meantime, the other employee had arrived for work and they all waited for Jane to show up. Jane arrived just before 9 a.m., acting as though nothing had happened, and greeted everyone with a good morning as she walked through the door. However, she was apparently taken slightly aback when she noticed Sandy's boyfriend seated in the far corner of the office. At this point, Jane was midway to her desk when Sandy informed her that there was no need to go any further and that she had accepted Jane's notification of retirement. She then handed Jane a check compensating her for the hours she had worked in the current pay period as well as two weeks wages in lieu of Jane finishing out her final two weeks before her retirement. Jane was dumbfounded and went into panic mode, but I didn't retire, I'm not ready to retire. Sandy responded that indeed she had retired, given her notice and had proof of it in writing. All Jane could do was continue repeating, but I didn't retire, I'm not ready to retire, while unsuccessfully attempting to get the support of the other employee who refused to come to her defense. Sandy then pointed to the box containing Jane's belongings, wished her a happy retirement, and told her to leave the office. Jane quickly rifled through the box and noticed that the small box containing the index cards with client information was not there. She insisted that Sandy return it to her, which Sandy refused to do, explaining that it was property of the business, contained personal client information, and that she would be in violation of Canadian privacy laws if she were to let Jane take it. Jane's shock had now turned to obstinance and she refused to leave without the box. Both the other employee and Sandy's boyfriend started to get involved, repeatedly telling Jane to just leave. Sandy then informed Jane that if she didn't leave, they would have to call the RCMP, Canadian police. At which point, Sandy's boyfriend dialed 911 to inform the dispatcher of a disgruntled former employee at XYZ Travel Agency, who was refusing to leave the premises. Within a few minutes, two police officers arrived and Jane immediately ran to the door, ranting about being fired and about the missing box of client info. In order to de-escalate the situation, one police officer told Jane to come outside and explain to him her side of the story. The other officer remained in the office to hear Sandy's side of the story, agreeing that Jane was not legally entitled to the box of client info. The other officer then re-entered the business and told Jane to wait outside. He said that Jane was insisting that Sandy was holding on to her personal belongings, namely a box of important information. Both Sandy and the officer who had spoken to her explained the contents of the box to the other officer, who in turn agreed it was not Jane's property. The police officers then picked up the larger box of Jane's personal belongings, took it outside to Jane, and told her she needed to go home. 
to rub salt in Jane's wounds. The next day, Sandy put up a large sign in the window of the business congratulating Jane on her retirement and even put a small announcement in the local newspaper doing the same thing. The icing on the piece of revenge cake was Sandy when filling out the necessary government forms for when an employee quits, gets fired, or retires, made sure to check the box labeled retired for the reason for Jane no longer being employed. By doing so, Jane was ineligible to collect unemployment insurance benefits. Jumping down to the comment section for this one, we have one from a user called Dingleberries for Sport. It says, I don't know why incompetent or unliked people always seem to shoot themselves in the foot. My workplace had an employee who made more work for others than she ever did herself. She got offended over a demotion with a minor pay decrease and quit in a rage. Ever since then, she's floated from one MLM scam to another, never did get another full-time job. Another reply to this comment from a user called Sanity Janity really sums up this story. It says, They don't acknowledge their incompetence even to themselves. They are convinced they are the best employees and that the business would collapse without them. They also think they are very clever. Jane in this story was disliked by all of her coworkers and her boss, but she may not have known it because they were walking on eggshells around her. I absolutely love how Jane tried to get the support of her coworker, and her coworker just sloughed her off and refused to come to her defense. That was beautiful. Our next story today comes to us from Affectionate Gold84. Want some free gas? I got you, bro. Let's jump right in. Hope this qualifies as pro revenge. Let me know if it needs removing. So several years ago, my friend, we'll call him Boris, and I would always help each other to do the spring cleanup for our properties. This included taking out damaged trees, preparing garden plots, and taking care of our weed infested yards. I was going to be first on the cleanup detail, so I prepared tools and implements the Friday before the big cleanup was to happen. Sharpening tools in chainsaw chains, lawnmower blades, and just getting everything in order. Among those tasks was mixing gas with two cycle oil. Finished up kinda late and generally put things away for the next day. The next morning, Boris shows up with coffee and biscuits around 8 a.m. As we were sitting on his tailgate enjoying breakfast, my neighbors ride by in their beat to heck Chevy Cavalier, smoking like a freight train. We will call them Rocky and Bullwinkle. Boris and I made the usual jokes about the amount of smoke pouring from the exhaust. Darn, bet they go to the gas station and fill up with oil and check the gas. We soon finished breakfast and thought no more about it. As we begin to get the tools laid out and hatch out a plan of attack, I cannot find my gas cans. No mixed gas, regular gas, or a gas can in general. That's when it dawned at us why the car Rocky and Bullwinker were driving was smoking so bad. I'm pissed to say the least. Well, all Boris and I could do was go shopping for gas cans, gas, and more two-cycle oil. After we returned, we saw Rocky and Bullwinkle pass by several times, but all in all, we got a lot done. The next weekend, we dedicated to clean up at Boris's. A weekend or two go by and we have a family dinner at my wife's, Rocky and Bullwinkle's grandparents. Toward the latter part of the evening, we were having a few drinks. Most people had left and myself and wife's grandfather were shooting the breeze when I had to take a leak. As I was doing so, I saw a gas can with very distinct paint on it. I inquired from the old man about how it came into his possession, and he stated Rocky and Bullwinkle left it there. I simply explained it was mine as was another and loaded them in my truck. It ate at me every time that POS car with my past neighbors went by, so I hatched a plan from a rotten egg. I went and bought a few gallons of gas, a few gallons of diesel fuel, and some other various oils. I made a concoction of these different chemicals and filled my new 6-gallon gas can I had to purchase. With some clean gas, I filled the lawnmower and cut some grass that evening, making sure Rocky and Bullwinkle saw me. Then I put everything away but forgot and left that rotten egg gas can out. I got up and went to work the next morning and didn't even think to check on the can. But when I got home, I checked and it was gone. My wife informed me that my plan must have worked as she watched Rocky and Bullwinkle go in and out with the car not only smoking, but spitting and sputtering as well. The last time they rode out, they didn't ride back in. Hmm. They gave me about an hour of peace before they came over and wanted to know if I could look at the car and see what was wrong. If it could not be fixed on the side of the road, maybe tow it home. My response? I've had a long day and have a migraine, maybe tomorrow. I saw the panic set in when I told them that. 
That's when they told me they had no insurance and it was on a main road. Tough luck. So the highway patrol did run across it and had it towed. It was going to cost them around $500 to get it out of impound. Plus, they had to have current registration and insurance. Car wasn't worth it. Well, they are those type of people that good luck just falls on them, and the pastor for a local church gave them an old Ford Taurus. Took me a few cans of rotten egg gas, but I got the motor to lock up after about a month. This time it quit in their grandparents' yard. So they scrapped it, and as luck would have it, they got their income tax returns. They bought a nice-looking Ford F-150, but it began having problems too. Smoked really bad. They did take it to a mechanic that eventually found the problem. He got the truck running right again for about $1,500, and I have never had any more gas come up missing. Thanks for reading. Alright, is anybody else here thinking that these Rocky and Bullwinkle characters weren't the smartest people out there? Because you'd think the first time you stole the fuel, and your car was smoking like crazy, that you wouldn't steal the fuel again. Now, at the beginning of this story, OP said they didn't know if it was pro-revenge or not. I'd say about $2,000 damage to a couple of different cars, plus just the inconvenience caused by that, is definitely pro-revenge. Our next story today comes to us from Revolutionary Ant 209 My 8.5 pound revenge on my cheating, thieving ex. Let's jump right in. When I was at uni, I started dating this guy. At first, he was wonderful, dedicated to his studies, fun to be around, attentive, and always surprising me with things, working hard at his job, etc. Then, bit by bit, things unraveled. He started skipping classes. Then, he barely bothered to go at all. Worse still, he never helped around the house. Never washed up, cleaned up, did laundry, nothing. He was even fired from his job for too many no-shows. All he wanted to do was sit at home and play Xbox or browse the message boards and forums. This was in the days before social media when dinosaurs roamed the earth. This left me having to pick up extra shifts, sometimes double and triple shifts, all while going to class and studying. I later learned that this was a pattern for him. He'd be really dedicated to whatever he set his heart on, but then get bored and fall back into old habits. Then he'd find a new passion and rinse and repeat. I knew I should have ended the relationship much sooner, but I held out hope that he would snap out of it, that maybe it was just exam stress getting to him. I desperately wanted things to go back to how they were, but it was not meant to be. I caught him cheating and threw him out. I was so stressed with everything that it wasn't until the next day that our joint savings account crossed my mind. There was a little over 5,000 pounds in there, and bar a few hundred from him, the rest was money I had saved. I checked the account, and it was all gone. My ex had cleaned out the account and moved into a new flat with his side chick. I called the bank. There was nothing they could do. He was authorized on the account. I contacted the police. They told me there was nothing they could do since it was a joint account, so nothing criminal had happened. They suggested taking it to civil court, but said I'd probably spend more money than I get back in legal fees, so it likely wasn't worth it. My ex had stolen 5,000 pounds, and there was nothing I could do about it. I felt like such an idiot. I got even angrier when I saw his posts on various forums boasting about his new game consoles, new games, new TVs and gadgets, all bought with my money. I'm not usually a vengeful person. Petty on occasion, sure, but I've never wanted to exact revenge as much as I did right then. And I knew just how to do it. While I was a student, I tempted every summer to help pay for my studies. One such job had been for a debt collection agency. The work was crappy as you can imagine, but it paid really well, and it was only for a few months. My ex had been dodging debt for many years, and he was very proud of that fact. He was also proud of the fact that his debt was close to being statute barred, and he hadn't paid a penny. For those of you who don't know, in the UK, creditors have about six years to collect a debt, and then it becomes statute barred. That means the money is still owed, but creditors have no legal way to enforce payment, such as using bailiffs. My ex was a few months away from reaching statute barred status. However, what a lot of people don't know is that making a payment on that debt resets the clock. If you pay any amount, then that six years starts from scratch. 
Previously, I had used my insider knowledge to help him dodge the debt. Now, I would use it to hit him where it hurt. By the end of our relationship, I was handling everything, including his debts. I had the paperwork, so I knew who he owed and how much. I called his creditors up. I was honest and said I was a friend calling to make a payment on his behalf. I didn't pretend to be him because that would be a big legal no-no. They weren't allowed to disclose any details, but they were able to take payment. I paid the minimum I could on each debt, about one pound on most, but one had a minimum payment of one pound 50. It was the best eight pound 50 I have ever spent. I also made sure to give them his new address and contact details, as well as his parents' address. Having worked in the biz, I knew they wouldn't change the address since I wasn't the account holder, but they would note it. They had various systems where they could search for his name against that address and see if anything came up. If they got a hit, they'd change the address. The trap was set. All I had to do was wait. A few months rolled by, then it happened. His posts on the forums went from boasting about his new gaming PC to panic about a court date. He called me and begged for advice. I told him to F off. Seeing I wouldn't help, he asked for advice in the forums. One of his online friends told him not to turn up to court. That way, they wouldn't be able to prosecute without him there. It was terrible advice that was 100% untrue. In fact, not showing up is one of the worst things you can do, especially in civil court. This was getting better and better. The court date came and went. My ex, naturally, didn't go. A few weeks later, my ex posted photos of his empty flat. Bailiffs had cleaned him out and taken every last one of his shiny new gadgets and toys. On top of that, he ended up with several CCJs, county court judgments. These are a big deal and can seriously damage your credit history, making it hard to get bank accounts outside of basic ones, near impossible to get credit, including getting a mortgage, and it can also make it hard to rent a place since many landlords don't like renting to people with CCJs as they're considered high risk. He also won't be able to find jobs in the financial sector. Now that he was broke and didn't have nice things, his side chick left him. I never got my 5,000 pounds back, but it felt good to see everything he bought with his ill-gotten gains taken away. I hope that 5,000 pounds was worth it. For anyone wondering how a student accrued six years of debt, he started at the university I attended when he was 25. He had initially gone to a different university at 18, but dropped out at 19 and went into the world of work. Then, he convinced his parents to fund a business degree. He wanted to become an entrepreneur. And for anyone worried about the age gap, I deferred my uni start date by a few years so I could travel. I was 22 when we started dating. He was 26. Wow, this is like the poster story for not having joint accounts until you're married, and even then, still having your own accounts as well, just in case. This was mentioned to OP down in the comments by a user called Zorab1. They said, you learned a lesson too. No joint account unless married. It is too easy to cut and run otherwise, and nothing can be done. This won't stop an account from being cleaned out, but can be brought up in divorce proceedings. OP responded to this one and said, Yes, it was a very hard but important lesson. I just wish it hadn't cost me £5,000. It was my own stupid fault. Well, you know, OP, I think we're all entitled to one major mistake and this was yours, but now you know how to handle an early relationship going forward. Never have a joint account. I can't say that enough. Never have a joint account. Because unless you're married and you've been married for 10, 15 years, you don't know where that's going. And honestly, in some relationships after 10, 15 years, you still don't know where that's going. This next story comes to us from Ashley or else. Make a developmentally disabled boy cry? Lose your family. Let's jump right in. My former boss is the worst human being I've ever met. He did all sorts of things to mess with anyone he didn't like. So, a while ago, I was at a family event in a local park, walking with a young boy from our family who is developmentally disabled with Down Syndrome, Ben. Ben does fairly well, all things considered, but he's always been sensitive to anyone making fun of the way he looks or his condition. We're just having a good time on our little stroll, Ben and I both enjoying the day. Along comes my boss walking towards us. I'll call him Rob. 
I cringe at seeing him but smile and say hello to play nice. There's something you don't see every day, a pair of ugly retards walking together. Ben bursts into tears and Rob laughs and walks off. I deal with Ben and ignore Rob. I'm super pissed and trying to calm Ben down because for a few minutes he was totally distraught. Finally, I get Ben to focus on how he has me and a lot of other awesome friends and family and that Rob is a stranger and what he thinks doesn't matter. We walked some more and I saw that Rob was at the park with his wife and teen daughter, having a cookout and he apparently had been on his way back to his family from a trip to the toilet when he saw us. Back to being super pissed, I went back to our gathering and talked to an adult cousin of mine, Jake, telling him what happened. Jake wanted to get revenge on Rob, but I reminded him that this was my boss. I didn't want Rob to be able to know the revenge had anything to do with me, because then he'd make my work life even worse than he already had. So Jake asked me for anything I knew about Rob that might help. I told Jake a bunch of things about Rob, but the relevant info here is that Rob liked to drink a particular kind of locally made beer at a certain bar. Rob had talked of having a drink there on the previous Friday night while his wife and daughter were away visiting her family. Also, Rob had recently told a story at work about his wife's obsession with a particular little green fictional character. Let's call it Yabi Boda. Turns out, his wife kept a stuffed Yabi Boda on their bed at all times. I wasn't there for the revenge setup itself because I didn't want Rob to see me, but Jake filled in the details afterwards. It was basically this. Jake approached Rob and put an arm around his shoulders and tried to kiss him. Rob pushes him off. What are you doing? Rob's family is now paying attention. I'm just so excited to see you, sweetie. Friday night was so amazing. What are you talking about? Seriously, you're going to act like you don't remember now? I know you were a bit tipsy after all of those specific local beers at the local bar. But certainly you remember what happened later. Nothing happened later or ever. I don't even know your name. Really? You were screaming it on Friday. Rob's turning red. You lying son of a... Rob's wife interrupted. Listen, I don't know who you are, but this is my husband. I'm sure you have him mistaken for someone else. Please just leave us alone. Oh, no, I'm not mistaken. We had the best adult relations ever on Friday night, and now he's acting like he doesn't even know me. I told you, this is my husband. You're mistaken. Oh, maybe I am. I guess it was someone else who took me back to his place on Rob Street and had great adult relations with me on the bed right next to Yavi Boda. Sorry. Jake turns and walks away. Oh my god, Rob, what the F is wrong with you? You're gay now? Really? Already long story made a bit shorter, Rob's wife wasn't real happy with him anyway, and this was apparently the tipping point that made her file for divorce soon thereafter. Rob frequently complained at work in the following months about how he didn't care about his wife, but really missed his daughter, and how much it sucked to live in his new place compared to his old home. Every time he complained about his lack of a home life at work, I knew he did it to himself when he was mean to a developmentally disabled kid. The best part is, he never figured out I was involved at all. Wow, if you have a boss that's willing to say things like that to you in public, <laughs> report that to somebody higher up at the company, especially if it's a big chain, because that guy's not going to be working at that company very much longer. Add that to being divorced by his wife, and well, this whole thing just turned into nuclear revenge. Our next story today comes to us from this very long username right here. <laughs> Keeping me up at night with your parties? Enjoy being shamed on the national news. Let's jump right in. In September of 2020, the apartment next to mine was let out to two young women, both students. After they settled in a bit, it turned out they wanted to have a party. No big deal, except Belgium was in full lockdown at this point due to COVID, and you were supposed to only have one fixed visitor over. But then again, to be young again, etc. So I didn't really care. During this time, I was working in healthcare. I work with the mentally disabled, but I volunteered for the ad hoc COVID team, meaning I got called upon to tend to those residents who were sick and needed quarantining, or were effectively diagnosed with COVID. This meant pretty long working hours, and I spent about 10 to 11 hours a day at work, with a full hour bike ride to and from work. Needless to say, I was pretty tired pretty much all of the time, 
so I wasn't looking forward to the noise from a party, but I'm pretty chill and know that living in the city, some noise is to be expected. So they are having their party, and I can stand some noise and music, but this party was effing wild. People shouting full on in the hallway, wrecking things, etc, etc. At about 4 in the morning, I introduced myself to the neighbors and asked them when they could expect their company, 20 plus people, to leave, and if they could refrain from having a party the next day, as I have to work and get up at 6 every day. So they promised they would keep it down the rest of the night, they didn't, and that they wouldn't have a party the next day. Plot twist, they did have another party, and then did another one the day after. At this point, I had been going a full three nights without sleep and was nearing neurosis. Every night I had talked to the girls, and every night they would be full of apologies and stuff, but nothing would change. I also felt terrible when I had to enter their place, because it would be absolutely packed with people, and I work with some very vulnerable people at work who I wouldn't want to spread COVID to. This was pre-tests, pre-vaccines, pretty much of all the knowledge we have now about COVID. Luckily, the weekend came and they went to their parents and I could recover a bit. Suffice it to say, I wasn't really liking my new neighbors. During the next few weeks, they refrained from big parties, but they would have a constant flood of people coming over during the night. And by constant, I mean constant. Like their bell would ring 70 times a night and people would always be coming or going. And those people would be drunk and loud. Our communal hallway is pretty much an echo chamber because it's all stone and any noise would travel throughout the building. Basically, I couldn't rely to sleep at night. It drove me crazy. I could only sleep Friday through Sunday because then they would go off to their parents or whatever. I couldn't grasp how they could know this many people that would always be coming and going. During one night while knocking on their door to complain about the noise, I encountered my upstairs neighbor, who is also on Reddit, hi, and decided that we would have to join forces to get this to stop. My neighbor told me some important bit of information. The reason there were people coming and going all the time was because they used their apartment as a makeshift bar and hangout. During this time, bars were closed due to COVID, and all those students were using the big apartment to hang out. Moreover, across the street was another frat house with five boys living there, and that too was a secret hangout. So people would hang out at those two places and cross the street if they wanted a different atmosphere, or wanted to see their other friends, etc, etc. And the boys from across the street would also come over 15 times a night. Most visitors seemed to be law students or affiliated with them. Basically, our communal hallway was just a part of their cafe space now. So we tried talking to the girls. Then we started to talk to the visitors. None of them had any sympathy for us when we were asking them to be quiet at 4 in the morning. Most of them just laughed at us, as we were the pesky neighbors, no doubt. Even more of them were just so wasted that they didn't know what they were doing. So we started calling the police, dozens of times. Most of the times, they weren't let in and police told us they couldn't do anything. We kept calling, as we wanted a record of our calls in the system. Belgium was still in full lockdown at this point, and what they were doing was full-on illegal. Even so, police told us their hands were tied if they wouldn't open the door. When the police couldn't help, I turned to the next best thing. I am a social worker, and so I have no problems looking up information and calling around to look for help. This is what I did. Most places, student unions, police, town hall, were understanding but couldn't really do much. So I acted on the suggestion of the upstairs neighbor and contacted one of the girl's deans. I shot him a nice email about sorry to have bothered him in taking up his time, but I had this big group of students from his faculty ganging up every night and maybe he wanted to know about it since they were breaking every possible COVID rule that existed at that time. Especially since me and my neighbor were about to go to the papers with this story, as secret lockdown parties were becoming a thing in the papers at this point. The dean called me back right away, and we had a nice talk about our problems. He told me he was on it. So basically what he did was call the law student girl and her parents. Big drama ensued, and we finally got to sit down with the girls, and they finally sounded like they were sorry. Tears were shed, for which I had no patience to be honest. We learned that the police had actually been inside a few times, 
and they were issued tickets for having secret parties. Those were 300 euros each a pop, so no idea why they didn't just stop. We learned they were not happy because the dean had called them up at 11 o'clock and they were still asleep. To which I said, well, there is your problem. You are still asleep at 11 o'clock. I'm up at 6 every day and you girls haven't been a bit understanding about that. So we got to feel a bit like we got our revenge and we got to vent. But we kept it kind of nice and parted in good terms, hoping that this would be it and we could live together as nice neighbors. But if that were the case, I wouldn't be here, right? You'd think they would have gotten the point now and would refrain from making noise and partying. Well, you'd be wrong. Basically what they did was they moved to the frat house across the street and started partying there. There were slightly less people running to and fro, but the noise was still a problem. And we were now in the middle of the second COVID wave. And these people were meeting up with big groups like crazy. Well, I hadn't seen a soul in almost a year. Never mind the people at my work who were forbidden from even going to their own friggin' families. The whole thing was just ridiculous. My upstairs neighbor happened to film such a party across the street and had sent the clip to me. We were thinking about going to the press with our story, but weren't really sure if it would be a good idea. So I posted the clip of the party on the subreddit of our country to test the waters. It got quite some comments and upvotes, and it seemed most people were also sick of people disregarding the rules and having secret parties. After some talks with the upstairs neighbor, we decided to contact the press and simultaneously go up a step in the university hierarchy and contact the vice rector that had the power to start up a disciplinary case against the students. This person is one of 12 vice rectors for a total campus of about 15,000 students, so quite high up. Things moved fast. Local news actually picked up our story from Reddit and contacted me and we gave some background info. They confirmed with the police that cops had been dozens of times to our address and across the street and weren't let in most of the time. We mentioned that the university was involved and that we hoped they would finally intervene. The next day, the piece was on their website. It went viral there and got promoted to the sites of most national newspapers. Its headline was sensational enough, mentioning the dozens of times police had showed up and mentioning how healthcare workers were being kept up by selfish students. At the same time, the vice rector contacted us to take our statements, which we already had prepared up on paper, and informed us they would investigate and could possibly start up disciplinary actions. At the same time, more reporters were contacting me throughout the day, and we made sure to mention that to her and link the university the printed articles. The next day while at work, I got a message from the upstairs neighbor that a film crew from the national news was at our doorstep. He declined to talk to them, and I would have done the same since this was getting pretty big now, but they made a segment anyway. And sure enough, that night at 7, here was my street and a short section about cops standing in front of a closed door a dozen times, and the local press cop talking about the troubles of closed doors. Best part about it was that a student from the offending frat house across the street had let the film crew in, and said on camera exactly what we were accusing them of towards the university, that they had been having parties and didn't let the cops in, and that they had done it multiple times. No idea what made him think that was a good idea. Anyway, trying not to make a huge story even longer, the press died down some time later, thank goodness, and the disciplinary action from the university went through. Before the hearing, we sat down with the girls from our block and cleared some things up. We wanted to live like normal people together, and we tried to make some amends. Because we put in a kind of good word for them, they got the lighter end of the stick, 40 hours of community service and some probation. The guys across the street got 80 hours each, and each had to write us a letter of apology, which I thoroughly enjoyed reading every time I got one. Sad part is, most of them sounded like dumb young kids, but that was after getting called out on the news and being part of a disciplinary action. But we never wanted to escalate things this far. Some noise is to be expected when living in the same building, and we were never going to go to these extremes for some expected noises. But these people went to the extremes, and so we were forced to do the same. Rest of the year, a simple message on WhatsApp was enough to silence any noises we had coming from their apartment. If anything, 
I hope they learn that even very polite and chilled people can become very upset when presented with sleep deprivation and excessive noise. Now on OP's profile, you can actually find a video they took of the people across the street and let me tell you, they were definitely being extremely loud and I personally wouldn't want to put up with that until 4 o'clock in the morning or 6 o'clock in the morning or however long it was that they were staying up. It's pretty bad. So I was thinking a little bit about this story and how they were given fines but they kept on going anyway. And what I came up with is I think they were probably charging access to the apartment to the people who were coming in. Either that or they were on really nice allowances from mommy and daddy while they were at school and just never learned the value of money itself. I do kind of wish there were some charges that came about here because, let's be real, these were law students and they should be respecting the law. Check out all OPs linked in the description down below. I thank you for watching, I hope you have a wonderful day, and we'll see you tomorrow.